That's right, man. That's a good way to get the aggression out. I want to thank everybody for being here this evening, our work session for October. Do we need to call the roll? I didn't think so. Seeing uh, our first items would be finance. Mr. Laconan. We have many budget amendments on the agenda this evening. Um, all of the ones that are related to purchases are actually down in the purchase, so so those are down below, and uh, we're happy to go over any of the budget amendments you see before you tonight. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Moore. I was going to say thank you very much. I was going to bring that up. If we could make sure just in the future, that was so confusing to have us voting on, and honestly kind of out of order, voting on budget amendments. So in the future, like I said, anytime we have something that we need to take action on. If the budget, budget amendment that goes with that can just be included with that, I think it's much cleaner and easier to kind of keep track of where we're at. It felt very weird to approve the funding for something we hadn't actually approved yet. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Are there any comments on any of the budget amendments listed on the front page, one, number 1 through 11? Seeing none, are we good to put those on consent? Okay. Monthly financials, you want to share anything with us, sir? So uh, sales tax, we are right on track to hit around $24 million, uh, for this fiscal year so far. Of course, that's only two months in. Uh, we will get the letter for September sales tax tomorrow, so we'll update the reports for that. So if you ever want to see the most up-to-date, you can click on the link on our uh, web page. But we're in a good spot. We did not need a tax anticipation note, uh, so that's good news. And uh, sadly, due to our vacancies, we're not expending payroll monies as fast as well. So, Okay. Well, that's not good news, but it is good news. Mr. Lindsay. Uh, just to make sure I'm reading the bar graph right, it looks like that for July and August, we've exceeded last year's sales tax number by roughly 300000 in each month. So ho hopefully that trend continues. So, And then we and refresh my memory, but we didn't even budget what we took in last year for sales tax. So. We actually budgeted 16808000 so if all goes well, this revenue budget is going to be about $7 million above that. So, so sales tax should come in about $7 million above what we have budgeted. But we did that uh, cognizant of what was going to happen. Uh, and we did that to maintain maintenance of effort without losing actual dollars. But uh, I guess that my question should have been different, not our original budget before we got changed. We, five point what million deficit? Uh, it's 4.7. So 4.7. So if yeah. we stay at our pace right now, we're going to... We're going to come in at a surplus. With just sales tax, not even counting expenses. Property tax or any growth money, correct? Thank you. Any other comments on the financials? Questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Laconan. On to instruction. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to update, give you a few updates. Uh, we have completed our first round of case benchmarks. That was the benchmark assessment that we purchased through SR2. Uh, those are assessments for, were for grades 2 through 12. Uh, we will now, uh, it takes about two to three days for that data to cycle and we are will work with each each school to uh, go through the process of here's how you analyze the data well here's how you access the data so you can analyze it and the report features other programs so we'll be working uh, on that um, in the coming weeks so uh, teachers and, and schools and school staff and and, and uh, data teams professional learning communities will be able to look at that data um, and continue to make adjustments in instruction with the march on to, you know, the mid benchmark, trying to make that progress. Uh, and that's a standards based assessment. Um, also, you, know, you probably got an email about the calendar. As you know, it's, it's time for that. So uh, we sent out a general question about uh, do we still like the same format? Uh, we do know. Um, we do need to make some changes to next year's calendar, mainly just a change to the professional development date because we had some uh, 
the ACT date typically falls the day after we return, and high schools just want us to shift that to another day. So we'll be looking at shifting that, that professional development day. And if that's good, we'll make that change in sub sub subsequent calendars. So we will gather that information. We'll also, we have a, uh, a district parent advisory council meeting on the, this Friday? This, Renee, when is it? This coming up? This Thursday. So we will also gather information from them about the calendar. Uh, we kind of left it op open-ended so we could get feedback in general. Then we'll uh, work through that feedback and, and uh, uh, bring back former calendar committee and, and start to look at if we need to make adjustments to the calendar. Uh, I'm open for any questions. Mr. Lindsay, I don't know if where this falls in, um, so if I'm out of line, just stop me. But I uh, got an email this afternoon, like 4 o'clock, about Discovery Ed, uh, us losing I, I, I'm not sure I understand it, but I'd like to understand more about it. So as you know, we uh, intend on, we're proposing to fund Discovery Ed in, that's a part of that textbook purchase in SR3. Our application is currently at uh, its way known state director approval. It has not, uh, it has not been approved yet. Um, it, hopefully it should be approved soon. Um, we had reached out to Discovery, Gallipade, those vendors that we had rolled in and asked them, said pending approval of ESSER, will you provide us a trial, you go ahead. Gallipade did. Discovery did provide an agreement, uh, um, but their agreement only went to 10-15. Uh, so they have uh, shut their agreement off uh, as of 10-15. I think their language was they will only do an agreement with us if we do an, in, uh, an official intent to pur purchase. Uh, we haven't done. That. We haven't said we intend the pur purchase until we've got the money in our back pockets. I.e., the application is approved. The ESSER application is approved. Uh, so that's kind of where we are now. I mean, we're we're kind of at a standstill. Um, we can reach out to the vendor again and see if there's something else that could work out. Could they extend it? Um, or, you know, um, I, I don't know if we can push around the state. I think we've done all the nosing around that we possibly can to see, uh, but we don't know where that status is. And so that's where we are right now. It sounds, it sounds like that you guys are just got stuck behind the eight ball with it timing-wise. but. Uh, I guess hearing that explanation, my frustration comes with the vendor that that we've had a relationship with for some time, and we, I mean, this board approved that the ESSER funding, so that should let them know it was our intention to move forward with them. So I, that, uh, from a personal standpoint, I I don't know how um, loyal I want to be to that vendor if if they're not willing to work with us. Well, uh, and let me say, you know, that was the vendor that we had a relationship in, in, in the prior administration. Uh, we started the school year last year with a, a parent agreement that uh, uh, that uh, that had been signed, and uh, we had to push back and say we couldn't do that agreement. And uh, so that uh, not to uh, uh, not to go down on the vendor, but I, I you know I think they have been considerable in working with us and trying to. A move forward and let me clarify what he was saying was last year we had to put what had happened was a contract was signed without board approval so at that point we were told we were not going to go that direction with discovery ed so we had to tell them we had to take away that <clears throat> and do that and they worked with us on that they were willing to step forward but the only problem was is we had to show a intent that we were going to purchase that was the only thing they would do we had a sign saying we were. Um, when the contract was looked at finance, they said we cannot sign that contract because uh, until that money's approved, you, you can't sign it. So once the money's approved, we'll go back to finance, we'll talk to Dis uh, Discovery Ed and see if they'll go ahead and let us sign that contract at that point. Uh, hopefully, the, the way it was told to us, ours is our ESSER 3.0, it's been approved on every level up. Now it's at the top level. 
and we've been told it should, we thought actually it'd be by today, and it just didn't happen. So as soon as we get that approved, hopefully we'll be able to go ahead and sign that contract for the intent. Thank you. Mr. Howe. Um, and we, we've done business with Discovery Ed for quite some time. In fact, at one point, they actually gave us their product for free for an at least an entire year, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I, I think that they've done a, what they can. My concern really is what are we going to do until we get it back? Like that's, we've got kids in school, and we're trying to go forward. So what, what are we doing until we get that back? Because right now we don't know when we're getting that extra money back from the state so he the, the vendor did the MLS and said that they will you know they won't destroy the data or anything so the progress whatever's saved in there will not go away they will keep it as is they will keep all of our um, logins as they are until it's approved um, you know the the only other option I know is you know we uh, when we did the budget we cut the textbook line down to the amount we needed to pay the second half of the ELA adoption. So that amount is still in the textbook line. It's $950,000, whatever that balance of that second payment. We did, don't want to spend that for the same reason as we're awaiting S approval and you know then we know that we can have additional funds. Uh, we could pay that out of the textbook line, um, you know, we could bring a, uh, a a proposal to purchase and tell the vendor we intend to purchase, uh, but that would have to be, you know, something that uh, you guys would be okay with us going ahead and using those current textbook line funding items that are in the general purchase budget to purchase discovery to go ahead and uh, complete a proposal. Uh, uh, bring a proposal to you at the uh, at the board meeting to say we will purchase it and I think the vendor will if we've got an intent to say we're going to purchase it I think the vendor will purchase it but yeah and I understand what you're saying but today is the 19th so we're not using that 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 their textbooks that information to teach kids in class for the last four days so and and right now Honestly, it, it's it's up in bureaucracy right now. So we don't know. It could come back tomorrow. It could come back three weeks from now. What are we doing for our children for a science curriculum? Because that's what this is what we've been using this as until we get that back in place. The data. I mean, that's one thing. But but more importantly, so I have a book, and now poof, I don't have a book. So what are we doing to teach our children in school without that resource? The coaches are continuing to work with grade level chairs to uh, uh, continue to work with developing lessons that they already had or previously to continue to move forward. Um, we'll have to do some more digging into, you know, if this continues certainly to either uh, try to do some uh, um, looking at the pacing guide and uh, work with science teachers to develop some additional curriculum while we're awaiting ESSER. Okay, um, so I, I guess I don't understand why we didn't have a contingency in place. Like this is something that we knew could happen. Uh, however re remote it, is, is it is, it, it happened. I don't know how we can move forward as a district if we don't have the resources in the students' hands for the, in not part of the year, most of the year, some of the year. We've had a problem with this in the past where we, we just don't have the resources in the students' hands when they need it. Um, right, this has happened right. many times with, with iReady, iMath, where we order it and then it comes in two months later. So we're two months into a school year and, and you know, so I mean, I, I thought we were really trying to work through that. Ideally, And yeah. so, yeah. you know, and then we're blindsided with this, so which, I mean, if you knew the agreement was set to end on the 15th, you're not really blindsided, so I mean, I, I just I, I just expect to have continuity in a year, in the last two years where we haven't had continuity, right. and I would like to I mean, I really would like to see something moving forward to where we see this coming down the road. We know that there's a contract end. I would like to think that it wasn't just like somebody logged in and was like, oh I don't know it's not working, 
and then we had to figure out why it wasn't working. I would like to know, think that well, we knew this was coming, and then if we did, why didn't we do something about yeah, it? Yeah, we certainly want to, you know, be able to, and you know, as you, as we indicated in the plan, uh, with using those ESSER funds, we would be able to be ahead of that and never have those situations. There would always be textbook money available where we wouldn't run into those situations, and we could be more predictable in terms of we already got the funds, we can order the, the uh, things that we need and continue to move forward. Uh, um, like I said, we can, uh, we've missed these, uh, the, the three days. We can certainly uh, try to uh, come to some solution as we talked about and uh, get the software reactivated or continue to work as we are until we, uh, uh, we can come, we can come, I can. And I'm picking on you because you're the one talking. But really, it's, it's, it's us. We cut that out of the budget when we should not be cutting textbooks out of the budget. Yep, this was in the budget. Yes, yes. And we cut it out. So we just, going forward as a board, need to be very, very, I mean, and yes, you, you guys said, hey, we can cut it out. We can put it right here. We're complicit in that. So I'm not just poking at you. I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's us as well. Yes. So, thank you. Mr. Lindsay. $75,000, what we're talking about. No, I think the actual agreement is for for K three is one hundred thirty five, but so the, the for three three through twelve is yes seventy three is what that agreement was. Yes. So, so well, so one hundred thirty five. Yes, sir. Day. Yes, sir. So, my, I, I kind of share the same frustration as Mr. Howe. We knew October fifteenth was coming. We had a meeting a week ago today. We could have approved a contingency plan that hey, if we don't have this. We, we, we just we just looked at our financial report and and we taken in six hundred thousand more dollars than we took in last year in the first two months in sales tax and then we just sit here and said because we haven't been able to fill positions we there's a surplus in the expenditure line so if we got to spend one hundred thirty five thousand dollars in some other way than ESSER then we we need to do it and make sure we have. Uh, the, those materials because what happens and it's not going to but what happens if if our ESSER application doesn't get approved then what do we do or are, are, are we sitting here two months from now and, uh, and I'm going around the world but but Mr. Lieutenant could do you think this could be deemed an emergency purchase that maybe could be done without our approval we have current tax money in the budget so we we could use that uh, without it being an emergency, uh, well, without well, your I, approval. But uh, there's except there. for twenty five thousand. Um, but emergency purchase usually means somebody's life is at risk, or uh, c services will completely have to shut down. Uh, it's it's usually a grave situation. So I, I would say I probably can't. We probably can't justify that, but we can. Uh, get it purchased through the regular textbook line item rather than ESSER funds. So, so the cash flow is not an issue at all right now, but the approval process may take some time. Um, but that, uh, I'll just stop. Can something be brought to us for the November voting meeting? Yes, I think what we can do, I'll talk to Doug. I have some ideas kind of floating in my head what we could do maybe to go ahead and get that done. All we need to do is make sure that we have a an intent to pay con and where his office will let us sign that and that will turn it back on to us. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Mr. Moore. Yeah. So I'm going to jump in on this too. I'm just, I'm baffled here um, because it, like it's confusing. I, is was the plan really to just like ride this out and wait for the ESSER money to come in? I mean, I guess so. I'm going to do a really simple analogy because I'm trying to make my brain wrap around this. If I had a bus full of books and they just burned up in a car accident today, but we knew that the warehouse over there that sells books had the same number of books over there, would we wait on it because of ESSER funds and we knew we had kids that need books today? No, we'd just go ahead and buy them. I mean, essentially those books went away. And we need them for the kids in the classroom today. I understand you guys, we, we did funding for future adoptions, but I would have to think that current classroom use takes precedence over future adoptions in a, in a situation like this. 
So I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, were you guys just going to kind of let it ride out until we get that back? It just seems like a poor strategy to me. I, I don't understand that part of the strategy here. As you know, certainly we can't, you know, with a purchase that's over $25,000. But you guys could have brought it. it to us yeah. well yeah. before and, and now. We're, we're, as it, it seems, we, didn't, we wouldn't have a funding strategy for it, and that's what we said. We have a funding. Of course it is at the last minute because we were hoping not to use those available funds. Well, hoping is, is a poor way to plan this out. Um, but I, mean, I know what you're saying, but, I mean, that to yeah. me is – this is what's frustrating me because, again, I'll, I'll go back to one of the overarching things I had when we went, started going down the road of using ESSER money. This gets exactly into the problem I had there was now we're starting to rely on maybe money to do essential business and day-to-day -day business. And that is – this is a small piece. This is just, a, I think, what it looks like, something we could probably solve pretty easily. This has been frightening to me when we discuss this from day one is when we start trying to operate on maybe money. And this is the kind of thing we run into. Um, I just that that troubles me, and again, I'm 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 struggling with why we didn't have a better plan in place. You guys could have easily brought us a budget amendment that would have moved those out of the the funding that's already there for future adoptions. We could have had this hammered out pretty easily. Um, the funding again, the is available. Is we would just you know we could that and that's you know the problem. We could we could bring the purchase to you, and we could uh, say that it's because the funding's there. It's just it's just set aside for. Another item, and just, but again, this is immediate. I mean, this precedence. It seems like the hierarchy of, of what we need to have day-to-day -day operations need to take place now. Um, I, I just I struggle with that part. Okay, so you guys are bringing something for the voting meeting that we can address this. All right, um, where do you want to go next under instruction, Ms. Ventura? Good evening. For those of you that do not know me, I am the Director of Special Programs here in Murray County, uh, and I am here tonight to talk to you about a signing bonus, bonus or a, a differential pay plan for special education teachers. Um, I um, have a short presentation on the board agenda, and I'm sorry for the lateness of it being put on there. Um, Basically, the situation that we find ourselves in is that we have 15 special education teacher openings currently posted on the Murray County Job Board. Um, I have listed the schools. Um, they are positions of all different types, sizes, and shapes. Um, they are resource inclusion, CDC, uh, behavior acquisition. Uh, they run the gamut. There is no pattern, in it's not like I'm missing a bunch of elementary, a bunch of middle, or a bunch of high. I'm missing across the board. Um, I spent the majority of fall break, just so that you know, talking to all of my contacts that I could possibly wrangle up from MTSU to Tennessee Tech to UT Martin uh, to UTK, um, and I'm hopeful that uh, Scott did something at UT Southern <laughs> today, mentioned me. Um, just trying to figure out how shallow the pool is, and the pool is pretty shallow. Um, people are not picking uh, special education as a profession. So the, the pool is pretty small. So basically what I have in front of you is um, basically the numbers. Um, 15 positions are currently posted. That means about 400 students without services throughout our district. Now those of you that are familiar with special education know that I have a signed legal binding contract with about 2,700 parents in this district and 400 of them are missing their contractual services. Um, that's problematic to say the least. Not only is it problematic for those 400, it's problematic for a school when, when you're missing such a, an integral uh, staff member. That is the person who is responsible for the highest needs students. Um, that is our high needs children that need intervention. And, and let's face it, folks, those are probably the kids that have missed the most throughout all of this COVID. Um, they're, they're children that have huge gaps in their education pre-COVID and this is probably not helping that situation, just as honest as I can be. Um, unfortunately, we live in a state that allows very few loopholes in licensure 
Um, you know, I like to say there's special rules for special people, and unfortunately, the special rules are I don't have waivers or permits in special education. The only allowance that the great state of Tennessee allows in licensure for special education teachers is what we call job embedded. They must already have a four-year degree and then have chosen to go back and get a degree in special education. Um, and they must be in that degree pro they can't just say, well, I'm thinking about getting my master's in special education. No, they have to be already in that program to become job embedded. So again, the pool gets more and more shallow with all the rules that are placed. My proposal is a $5,000 signing bonus, if you will. Uh, the cost would be, if you take $5,000 and you add all the fixed costs, it becomes a $5,800 um, expense to the district. So total cost, were I to get all 15 positions, would be $87,000. Um, if you will uh, look back at what you just kind of thought about putting on consent, there was a budget amendment already for special education. It's uh, budget amendment 11042. I'm taking $400,000 out of uh, t the teacher line item, and I can still afford this $8,700. Okay, so we're not talking a budget amendment to take anything out of fund balance. I'm not shifting any money. The money is there. Obviously, the positions are empty and have been. Um, if you look at the third slide, uh, basically I've come up with some basic rules of the game, if you will. Um, the bonus will be paid in two installments, $2,500 after 60 days of employment, and then $2,500 to the employee upon completion of the school year. I only want to offer this bonus. I do not want to cross fiscal years at this point. So I want to offer this bonus after your voting meeting. Uh, give me, a, I think your voting meeting is November 2nd. So I have the start date as uh, November 9th. That would give me a week to do some PR and hopefully get some, get some candidates in um, through 228. So just that small window of time to kind of see if I can get December graduates, see if anybody's unhappy at the semester change from other districts. Um, also, if they are unhappy in the current gen ed position that they have here in Murray County and wish to come over to special education. Um, and I know that's digging a hole to fill a hole. However, we have seen that those positions are easier to fill. And we have a lot of people who are certified in special education currently working in gen ed positions throughout the district. Um, so transfers, December graduates, fully licensed, job embedded. People who would not be eligible are my current special ed teachers or someone who has worked for me this year. The last thing we want to do is create a um, hopscotch format, if you will, of you left for greener pastures, you're going to come back and then you're going to leave me again, or you're leaving um, Baker Elementary to go to Brown Elementary. Okay, I just don't want to create that. And, and those are negotiable rules. Those are the rules that, that me and my leadership team kind of, kind of thought about. Again, this proposal would not cross fiscal years. Um, I would give you data after the February ending date and kind of see where we are with that. Um, and then I would propose based on if, if this was a good thing or a bad thing and based on what other districts are doing, I would then have a proposal for next year's fiscal year. Something that um, we would have to talk about is how we, if this is successful and if this makes us competitive, I do think we'd have to have the conversation about, okay, how are we, um, those summer in between budget years, um, if I could grab some people over the summer and, you know, sometimes our budget, unfortunately, as you all are painfully aware, um, doesn't get passed in a timely manner. So we'd have to talk about that gap. Um, and I have a couple uh, ideas up my sleeve about that, um, and it would really depend on where we were fiscally as a district. Um, that's the quick and dirty of what I'm proposing. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions or give you as many details as I possibly could. Mr. Howe. So th this sounds really good. I, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking uh, about this, and you have obviously thought about it. You've got very specific time frames and dates in mind. That's great. Um, changing gears a little bit, so this is for our teachers. What about our, e our SPED EAs? I know that, I mean, obviously, if I'm a SPED EA versus a Gen Ed EA, 
I get paid the same, and I'm doing completely different jobs. So how are we? Are, are those positions being filled, or are they filled? I have a, a presentation coming up, which I can roll right into if you'd like me to, about special education assistance. Let's deal with this one first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are there Ms. Uh, Kinzer. I think it's great, I do, but I, I would like, Mr. Hickman, I want you to respond here in a minute, but I'm thinking this is the symptomatic of the problem we have all over the, the district. We're not competitive, salary-wise, even in beginning or anything else. I do know, because you don't know this, but I went to get my special ed degree well, come on All back. The years that I wasn't teaching <laughs> because I, it was a love for me. Um, and it's one of the most difficult to, degrees to get. And, and so I thought, you know, art sounds a little bit better. But anyway, um, I do know that I've sat in on a lot of 501 meetings and how, you know, parents, it, it, there is a lot that goes into being a special ed teacher. So from that standpoint, I can support this. But I also want to know, Mr. Hickman, what are we going to do to level out this, what what are we going to do to make the waters the same here? Uh, th this is to meet an immediate need that she has, but we've got other needs as well that really are based on lack of applicants and where we are competitively in the district. So, what is is this going to be a model, or are we going to do this in other categories, or are we going to say to some teachers that you're not worth? Uh, extra pay and some you are it kind of opens up a you know it does and right now we are in talks while well, i'm in talks uh, starting at the teacher level we have a the teacher advisory committee we've started there uh, if you look at all the research if you don't start there it will fail no matter what when you start talking about differentiated pay um, we've got to be very careful who all we do offer that to because it, it goes back to what you say your job's important more important yours is not you know, one of the reasons that we've escalated special ed education, because if you look at our job board, the biggest majority on there is SPED. And it, it, SPED has always been problematic to fill, but what we're seeing even more now is when she gets to the next part is when you, we start looking at the EAs, uh, we've never seen something like this. And uh, so to answer your question, I'm really going around the long way is, we're looking into it. We've been tasked to look into the differentiated pay. We're going through the steps that we need to to see what areas we need to look at. We're uh, polling other districts. And to be frank, all the districts we talked to said it's really not been effective except for SPED. And the only caution that I was given even with that was they really didn't see any help for SPED when you looked at the CDC classroom specifically because uh, that license is so specific, it's very hard to find folks that are actually going to get the, that license for CDC because you know you have the different levels of SPED. So you know that was one reason I felt pretty good to go ahead and go through with this. She had I asked her if she had spoke to the teachers about this, start at that level, and she had. They felt pretty good about it because they were tired. They they're beat down by the size of their caseload. So we went ahead and said, since this is such an immediate need because of not just, and, and having a, a teacher in all areas is important, but when you start looking at SPED specifically, we're, we've got a lot of federal laws, federal rules, federal guidelines that we have to follow, and um, we're, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> so that's why we went this avenue, but we are looking at other other areas because I don't think this is something we should just bring before on a whim and say hey we're going to start offering different we want to offer differentiated pay for this we want to make sure we we cover down and do the right thing with teachers and talk to them and try to get an idea of where, what area we need to go to and, I, and it, let me just reiterate I, I'm all for this but I want to remind this board as we uh, pat ourselves on the back that we've got this excess money from revenue that is not budgeted uh, that's on the backs of teachers that didn't get a raise and, and, and haven't gotten a raise that's comparable to the cost of living. And so, you know, I, that just always comes back to me of like, oh, great, we financially, we're just doing really good, but you know, we're not taking care of our employees. 
this is a, a beginning. Uh, I, I know that it's harder to get a special ed uh, position. It's harder to be a special ed teacher. It really is. So I do support that. And, and let me add one other thing that I forgot to add is we also had to get approval from state to add this as part of the differentiated, differentiated pay plans because those are due in June. Uh, we reached out to them uh, first before we brought it before you to make sure it was approved and they said that they would approve that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lindsay. I'm gonna sound, try to not sound too harsh. Um, I, don't, I appreciate the, all the work you put into it, and, uh, but I, I don't have a problem with the differentiated pay plan, but I do have a problem with signing bonus. <coughs> and here's where I come from with that. I've been a direct TV customer for 15 years, <laughs> and they offer people that have never been with them these deals that I can't get. So if, I, if I'm a SPED teacher and I've been a SPED teacher for 10 years, what am I getting out of this? Absolutely, and we've had those conversations. And I, and I do have some employees that are going to call you uh, should this be passed. Um, when I meet with my, um, with my leadership team, and my leadership team consists of, of teachers throughout the di special education teachers throughout the district, um, you know, the conversations are, okay, I, I can't, you know, the, the teacher pay teacher, the sub um, situation that we have where we pay teachers to maybe work through their planning, that doesn't work in a special education environment because basically what we've had to do is like Central's missing three special education teachers. So the 261 special needs students, we just slice and dice and you got this many and you got this many and you got, because the option is not stick a sub in there or have, um, the gen ed art teacher come and do IEP meetings and um, very specific interventions, accommodations and modifications for. So at the end of the day, what I'm, what I'm hearing from my staff is we would rather watch somebody get this than continue on this path. Now, I will also say this. As a te you know it's very hard for me to even sit in this chair as a teacher. I mean, I, I'm just not used to sitting and talking. Um, so as a teacher, this does um, pull at my heart and, and, and really um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm in my head right now um, because it is unfortunate. My goal right now with the proposal that I have put before you is those December graduates. When I talk to MTSU and usually I talk to them, they have between 55 and 60 special education certified December graduates and they have 12, I need three of those. Like I, I, got, I got to play those odds. And, and I hate to make it sound like it's a game because it is not, but I got to play those odds. I want three of those to look at Murray County and think, huh, they respect me enough for me to give them a shot. Um, I, I've got to do something to become somewhat competitive. Um, Williamson County is offering a $7,000 bonus. Uh, Rutherford County is offering a $7,000 bonus. Sweet Little Giles County is only offering a $1,500 bonus. Um, but, you know, I mean, everybody's kind of, um, you know, putting together what they can put together. Um, a lot of districts have gone back to the differentiated pay plan where they are paying special education teachers more long term. I don't know if those are the waters we need to step in right now. I feel like we have a deep cut. I am bleeding. Uh, Ms. Gerard said it best when I, when I called the team together. She's like, I mean, you know, she, she's bleeding out here, you know. Um, so th I, I do want to look at this as possibly a short-term solution, but a long-term problem to speak to what Ms. Kinzer just said, that, that we have to look at as a district. We have to look at math teachers, science teachers, chemistry teachers, uh, you know. I mean, we have to look at all of those hard-to-fill positions. Um, right now, I just happen to have the deepest wound. That's why I'm kind of looking at this as, let's see if this works. And what am I going to do to keep my staff going? Um, how can I motivate them, uh, the ones that have been here for years? And that is something that I do go to bed at night every night thinking about, you know, because they are, they are carrying a heavy load. And I have to, at this point, really play those numbers to think, if I can lighten that load, that's what I have to do right now, today. Well, just to, to use some numbers you, that you threw out, um, 
if, I, if I'm a 10-year SPED teacher in Murray County and I can go to Williamson County and get a $7,000 bonus and, and you're not going to offer me anything in Murray County to stay, I'm gone. Exactly. <clears throat> so we, we, may cr we may be about to have a worse problem than we have now if we don't take care of those that we have. So I, I would be in favor of a revamp um, differentiated pay, pay plan, and I would rather put that money toward that. I, I just think that um, uh, I'm, I'm a pretty loyal guy. I, I got a lot of faults, but loyalty is not one of them. But uh, I just think we got to take care of the people we have now, and and if we take care of those people, I think it'll all work out. I, again, I I don't want it to seem like I'm bashing you. I, 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 I appreciate you thinking outside the box, uh, but just personally. Uh, and that is absolutely, I mean, we have, we have looked at those numbers. If, if we, you know, if we came up with a true differentiated pay plan, what, what would that do to my budget? What would that do um, district-wide to morale if you're not a special education teacher? And, and uh, you know, I'd be happy to come back with, with numbers with that. Uh, like I said, right now, I'm bleeding out, and I want to get as much as I can, and I do have the support of my staff in that this was a plan that they, that, that leadership, and, and they do go out and talk to other teachers. Um, you know, they're, they're representing their constituents. Mr. Howe, how many SPED positions do we have total? Not open, just all of them. 100. Okay. Special education teachers. So, I mean, if we took $87,000 and divided that out, we would not be talking about a lot of money to keep people to stay. So, so I would challenge you to come back at budget season with some sort of, well, actually, we're, we're about to do a pay study, and we'll see what that says, but I think we know what it's going to say. Um, so I would challenge you to take that information and go accordingly to make a differentiated pay schedule. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, moving, any other comments or questions regarding this? Okay, moving on, the next one. Or, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, do you want her to go ahead and do her other one? Or yeah, yeah, I was going to let her finish. Okay, I, I do have Esther in between, but we can let yeah, her go ahead. Yeah, I think while we're on this topic, we need to keep going. I'm a visual person. So I've just made you a little handout because I do not have time to upload it. If you would take that to the other group first, scroll back just a little bit, I would hear This is an educational facility. We're not allowed to have gum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was always told in school. <laughs> I promise you that Mr. Howell and I did not discuss this earlier, but uh, as, uh, as you all know and as anybody who's looked at the job board knows, I also have a situation going on with special education assistance. Uh, we currently have 24 special education assistant job postings. Um, the schools are listed uh, for you there. Um, in looking back on my data, in school year 18-19, I lost 23% of my educational assistance to gen ed positions. In school year 19-20, I lost 24%. School year 20-21, I lost 20% to gen ed. Uh, currently, I, I, I just lost uh, another one today, so I'm up to uh, about 12%. Uh, but when I typed this up, it was at 10%. Every year, just so you know, I lose between 35 and 40 percent of my educational assistance, um, but you can see that the bulk of who I'm losing is these are people who wish to work for Murray County Schools. They either want our benefits, they want to work with kids, they like the schedule. These are loyal employees that see a different job description and go for it, okay? Um, right now, special education assistants have a totally different, different job description, but they're on the exact same pay scale as general education assistants, okay? So they're going because they see somebody doing a job that they think they might like better. 
A gen ed assistant very typically may work with a small group of students, but very typically is uh, making copies, running errands. Um, they may work directly with some students, but not all day, every day. A special education assistant, from the time they walk in the door till the time they leave, should be with students with disabilities. Um, they are um, taking care of physical needs of students. Um, they are very often um, diapering uh, even adult children. Um, they are taking care of severe behavior needs, so they are getting kicked, spit, bit. Um, that is a very common, we have that in the job description, so there's no surprises but it, it, is, it is not an, an easy job. Um, they are, and they are so important to what we do and so important to giving services. Um, so again, the job expectations are very different. The job description is very different. When I look at surrounding districts, um, every single district, with the exception of Hickman County that touches Murray County, has a pay differential for special education assistance. Um, it, ra it ranges from uh, $2 an hour more to $0.75 cents an hour more. Uh, in Marshall County, the uh, pay differential is $0.75 cents if you are a, a general special education assistant, if you can use that, and then it's $1.50 more if you're in a CDC or behavior classroom. So they actually have a differentiation within the differentiation. My proposal right now, based on um, what we have in our budget and what we can do immediately, would be an immediate dollar an hour raise for all special education assistants. Um, and, and just looking at this, the cost will actually be less because they've already worked some of those 190 days. But that would be an annual cost of 147.4 for um, our general purpose 141 budget. If you look at the bottom line, our average special education assistant makes $14,000 or $74 a day. That is less than what you just approved for subs. So this is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is a, oh my gosh, these people are going to leave me to go work for ESS. These people are going to go work, you just approved 10 more uh, gen ed assistants. Um, this is an immediate, I am bleeding, which is why I, I had to put it on the board agenda for tonight. Um, I just don't think we will keep um, much of what we have if we do not act quickly. And if, if I sound um, a little alarmist, I am a little alarmed. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I think this would be good to go under new business. Mr. Lindsay. I'm, I guess I'm the wet blanket tonight, but um, it, I, I appreciate you going to bat for your people. Um, and and I I think I've sat here many times and I, I've even used the word criminal that we we pay these people what we pay them and I, and I truly believe that um, and, and that's why I was such a proponent for um, a salary study to to correct some of these wrongs but here's my concern is that we're we're picking one group of people out that we um, I, I think that that we all sit in this room and believe that we can do better in every area, whether it's Mr. Perriman's maintenance people, whether it's um, um, whomever. We, we can pick out any group of people, and I have a fear that if we start piecemealing this together and, and, um, and, and we give a raise to, to your people, then, then what does that cause to everybody else? And, and I'm ready to I, – I wish that – salary study was I wish we were talking about it tonight but uh, but I just have a fear when we start picking one group of, of employees out and treating them differently um, than, than everyone else what, what is how does that look down the road uh, there I'm, I'm just afraid of the ramifications that come from that and, and I will I will speak to two things uh, first of all I have been in Murray County for uh, just over seven years, and this will be my third salary study, and um, and I don't do not mean this disrespectfully, but from those first three salary studies, um, raises were not offered. Um, so um, waiting on the salary study is an option for me, and, and is something that that I have discussed and thought about, um, and I'm hopeful that that salary study will show that I'm still underpaying them. Um, 
but um, I, I do respectfully want to want to mention that we have done salary studies before, and the reason why we have different job descriptions is um, because not everybody can get the paid the same way, or or I, there has to be equity. And I hear what you're saying, and I'm not. I, I, please do not take this as being disrespectful in any way, um, but we have unfortunately come to the point where if we don't start paying our employees, um, and, and I think that's across the board, um, you know, Target's paying a lot better than we are. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Although I do agree with Richard Lindsay in some respect, I will say that we're talking about people who make $10.60 an hour. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, they do it either because they really, really want to, or they're trying to get their foot in the door. Um, and Jenna, and, and I would not do it. I'd, I'd be the, I'd be the guy going, I'm going to go to Jen Ed because that's an easier, that's an easier job. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make a lot, you know, bones about that. Um, and I agree that, you know, we're piecemealing this together, but you know what? I feel like even when this salary study comes out, we're going to be piecemealing this together because generally when these studies come out, it says, well, we need to give this 3% and 3% and Percentages just don't work. 3% um, of $10.60 is not the same as a teacher making $55,000 a year or an administrator making $95,000 a year. So, um, and the same goes for our, pretty much Mr. Perriman's entire staff. I mean, as far as his bus drivers, um, HVAC p maintenance, we're, we're missing the boat there too. So, I mean, we're, we're going to be piecemealing this together because I, I feel like this is going to show that we're underpaying this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one here, and then we can, I don't know, group other ones together like teachers, you know. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's just, un, un, unfortunately, we, I think teachers will understand that if we're giving these people a dollar an hour, they, Teachers respect these EAs. They need these EAs to do their job. These EAs are often, they're subbing for these teachers. These teachers love them. Yes. So, I mean, I, 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 mean, I understand where Mr. Lindsay's coming from, but I also understand that we've we, we got to have them. And whatever we have to do, we need to start putting these people in positions, and we need to do that with enticing them somehow. So I, I'm definitely for this. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hickman? You know, I feel like right now we're getting really into the weeds, but we're not. They're weeds we need to get into eventually, and we keep saying salary study, and I agree with Ms. Kinzer. You know, we really need to look not just at special ed, not just at classified, but the whole gamut of what we pay, are paying our employees. And I think the salary study will be a good premise to start from. I don't want to try to sell it as the end all be all to the board, but I do want to say it will be a good point for us to really start from and talk about and start moving forward. You know, I, I think as I go through the schools and part of what I do is I make sure I go to at least one faculty meeting by November from every school. And one of the things that I keep hearing over and over from teachers, and I agree with you, every one of them will come up and will agree that they think te they need a raise as teachers, but every one of them will line up and agree that our classified folks really need to be looked at because a at the end of the day, I think somebody said you can get paid higher more at Target. Well, we can look at our cafeteria workers. You can go to McDonald's or Popeye's and get paid higher plus a signing bonus. You can, we can go on and on. And that's why I don't, we really don't want to get in the weeds. I think we all know that. So I don't want to hold us up on that. But one of the reasons that I felt strongly bringing this one in front of in front of all of us is because, like I said, if you go look at our postings right now, when you talk about percentages, the vast majority is in special ed. I, I would challenge you to go look at any district's web page, and you'll see that the vast majority is special ed. And the problem why we have to pick out special ed, and I know it doesn't seem, well, we're kind of leaving other folks out. I'll go back to... There is a lot of federal guidelines 
we have to make sure that we're meeting or they take those federal and possibly state dollars away. So we have to at least show, you know, when they come in and say, why does this, this teacher have this much on their caseload when they're supposed to have this, we can show at least here are some of the things we've been doing to try to uh, attract folks to that position because we have to show the federal uh, government as well as the state when we start talking about SPED, what we're doing to try to, I don't know if cure is the right word, but resurrect the, the, the gap in what we're doing wrong from federal, federal dollars and with SPED. And we're monitored very closely by special ed, uh, quite, quite closely. So that's one of the reasons that we felt like we had to really segregate this part of the, the, the staff population is because of that federal monitoring. Thank you. I just want to throw my two cents worth into the discussion. I'm not a big fan of changing salaries or pace situations in the middle of the year. I think that's a budget decision. But I'm also looking across these four tables and I dare say that no two of you are making the same exact amount of money. And that's because you all have very different job expectations and descriptions. So I see a value in us really giving this some thought and uh, technically, I mean, in all honesty, even though I don't like this in theory, I think in practice it's the right thing to do. So let's move this on to new business and we'll take it up in November. All right, moving back to item that was in between these two. That's her funded items. Did you have anything else with that? No, just to say that you know, we're just to let you know that we're anticipating the answer approval. Um, if the funds are approved, we do want to uh, bring those textbooks items to you to, to for purchasing, uh, i.e., the second half of the payment for uh, our reading curriculum, uh, discovery, of course, that was already there, and uh. I think the, the top three items were those items in Quaver Music. The other ones we could bring later, but we intend to, those textbooks items were already approved by the textbook committee and you. So once we got that approval, we, we intend to bring those back so that we can go ahead and order those textbooks. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move on then to zoning and facilities. Mr. Perriman, your time to shine. Good evening, everyone. Um, the first thing there, the capital report, normally we give you one capital project report that's the 179 and 181 funds. Uh, this starting now through the end of the year, we've added a capital athletics uh, project report for you. If you look at it, you'll actually see we've spent no money out of it so far. We're going to talk to you about that tonight. And we've sent a capital project maintenance report that we will be updating every time there's a work session. Um, we talked about updating it at work session and at uh, board meetings, but we didn't know that everyone would go back through it. So you'll see that we spent about 70000 on that sheet. We're actually well up over a 100 uh, from when we posted that to your agenda. But we will give you a breakdown of what we're spending, how we're spending it, and make sure that if you have questions, we're, we're available to answer. So that's just an FYI for you. Same thing with the train report. That's the next item. Uh, 3.3.3, last month we talked about the Battle Creek land transfer. You can see the memo there. There was a question about the line that would be drawn and the acreage that would be given back to the county. I just kind of outlined in the memo what we've done since then. Uh, I did speak to Chairman Morrow, and he gave me direction as to what we would need to do in collaboration with the Murray County Parks and Recreation uh, uh, Department to come to a settlement or an agreement and then how we would proceed through the admin committee as well as the full commission. So we're, we are pursuing that, and I will keep you updated as that goes along. Uh, he did not, when I talked to Chairman Morrow, he said there was no sense of urgency to make sure that that transfer happened sooner rather than later. He would rather us get it right and everybody be on the same page. So we'll keep you updated as that goes along. 3.3.4 the turnover of the pump station at Battle Creek um, property to the city of Spring Hill. Um, we talked about that. We also talked about the developers that were there uh, kind of congruent to that property. Mr. Hall and I met with the city of Spring Hill last Thursday morning. I will say 
it was the best meeting with City of Spring Hill officials we've had in that we were able to sit down and share information. They were open about information as well as we, and, and that's no knock on anybody that's been there, but it was a good meeting. We discussed a couple of things, the transfer of the station as well as the lines that they would like transferred to them. The issue that came up through our meeting with them was they have to have an easement to all of the lines. And right now, the line that exits the property into Rutherford Downs currently runs uh, parallel to the creek all the way around the property that is in question about the transfer with, this, with the county. And so we really talked to the city and said, we need to hold on. We have to answer this tr land transfer question first because the easement would be the county's then and not ours. And we've got to figure out where the line's going to be, how it would be, would the county be okay with that easement, uh, and not make an agreement that was really you know, premature for us to make and go from there. We also, you see in there, uh, talk to them about our concerns about total capacity of that pump station and future usage of property that we would have there. Uh, and we went over numbers with them, not to get into the, the weeds, but Mr. Hall discovered that some of the capacity numbers that were originally uh, figured for that pump station had a different total student population for a high school than what we currently have. So we are working with the city and their sewer and water department to come back to determine what the true capacity of that pump station is. Uh, and then we will work through usage, future usage of that land and, and of that pump station uh, as we get to that transfer that would come to them. So we'll keep you updated on that as well, but just know this one really follows behind the land transfer uh, as we move forward, so. Thank you, I, I've got some questions. Yes, sir. How much is that land that's being conveyed to the Murray County Park, how much uh, acreage? We, we looked and, and we've not yet been able to sit down with park officials and decide really where we think the line should be, but we can identify up to about 30 acres, depending okay. on where we drew the line. So that would roughly be what we would convey to the county from the schools? Well, that would be what we would keep. I think if you look, the conveyance right now is 98 acres. Okay. The, the land in question is about 30. Okay. So we would be conveying 98 acres 60, to the about county. 68. 68. So 65 to 70, somewhere through there, depending on how we drew it, probably. Okay. My next question. Approximately the acreage of the land at McDowell that was given to the schools by the county. The, the lots that were conveyed over is going to be less than an acre and a half total. Uh, and, and, Mr. Fulbright, I'm pulling that kind of out of my head, but, but that's... Uh, the lots that were moved over in that agreement is going to be about an acre and a half at most. Would, would you, uh, just I know these are ballpark figures, but would it be safe to say that that amount of land is less than what would be coming to the county from the schools yes, at Battle sir. Creek? Yes, sir. Thank you. I just wanted that to be said. Mr. Moore. I, actually, it's kind of secondary to that. I know you said you had um, had some meetings that were very fruitful with Spring Hill. And I, I know in the last few meetings you've expressed that you've had some really good, started some really good relationships on getting information from the city of Columbia. Do you guys feel like y'all are on track to get that in place as well for Spring Hill? To we, we had, dis that was part of the discussion we had at the end of our meeting was how we kind of told them what city of Columbia was including us in and the process that we were going through and talked to them about how we could get the same type of information from the city of Spring Hill. So we're making we're reaching out to the p folks that they told us to reach out to specifically. Um, and what we asked was, City of Columbia has been very good about, they've, they've actually placed uh, me and, and Mr. Hickman, depending on which one can go, on the technical committee for the planning commission. So we get everything a month in advance that's gonna be on next month. And we're able to go through, look at, what we said to the City of Spring Hill is we would love to be able to get information ahead of time so that if we had a concern, which we don't know that we always would, we could attend their their planning commission meetings as well and be not seeing something for the first time as it came up. So we're reaching out and hopefully getting that information. Um, we, and, and we get let, a GIS let me, Go let, ahead. let me step in too and let me explain because I've talked to some of you. The technical committee is where it goes before it even can get to the planning committee. So it's very fruitful to have us on there because we've already been part of blocking one because of our input, 
before it could even get there. So that's kind of where we want to be at Spring Hill, but we're still knocking and we're, 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 we're at least getting some, some, some kind of answers right now. Uh, the, the, okay. the, other, the other issue, Mr. Moore, that we had up there was we've got to kind of weed our way through ahead of time what's Williamson County and what's uh, uh, Murray County. We know in City of Columbia right now we have 83 rooftops that are approved, 8,300, excuse me, that are approved yeah. already. Um, Mount Pleasant's got about 83, actually they got about 150. <laughs> uh, City of Spring Hill has 11,000 rooftops that are approved, but when we just asked the other day, well, how many of them are in Murray County? They said, well, we don't know. So the reason we would ask for that information in advance is that we would have time. Sometimes when you get those plat maps, you really have to dig into exactly where is this and, and it takes a little bit of time to figure out what you're looking at and with the, the dual county up there yeah. the, as much lead time as we could get it would be better for us. Okay. I, I was just gonna say I, I'm very happy here we're, we're finally doing that I just to my other board members especially as we start talking about um, you know what happens with the Spring Hill High School building what do we do next as we look at revisiting our five-year plan and kind of where that goes um, the better, the, the more and the better the information we get from both of these cities and kind of set up what we, our expectations are on, on data, um, I think we can hopefully make some better, and by better I mean more accurate and less costly decisions as we decide what we need uh, based on some really good information, which we've kind of in the past, I, mean, I look back at, I look at some of the information that's been coming out of Columbia right now, what you guys, I think, I've seen some of the stuff in Spring Hill that you guys are going to start getting, um, and I, I look back at what we did with the, um, the plan we did with uh, the gentleman who put the plan together for us. Dr. Dr. Register. Dr. Register. Uh, and, and honestly, it looks like we were almost guessing at that point. I mean, I, as, as I start to see that we're getting better information. So that it makes me very hopeful that we can make even better decisions and more accurate decisions moving ahead. So thank you very much for continuing to really work on getting that. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll keep you abreast of both the, the issues up there, the land transfer and the pump station as we go along. Uh, 3.35 athletic facilities improvements this this is in reference to the money that you um, approved for mr. Pointer to start the process of moving forward and, and, and pulling our athletic facilities up to the standards that the board has approved we have identified the projects that we're working through we are asking tonight or not tonight but we're asking at the board meeting for you guys to approve a GMP through Hewlett Spencer to manage 1.69 million of those dollars through a GMP where we can work fluidly uh, with contractors. We have not the two million full because we have gotten a, a cooperative pricing on lighting for two athletic fields that will be the other $310,000. We did not get that in time to get it on here to verify through SourceWell the exact number that uh, Mr. Luke Conan's department uh, has for us to do, but we know it's within that range. We will bring that for you next month, and we want to get that approved if we could prior to the first of the year because there's a lighting increase after the start of the year. Uh, but this would include all of the projects. Mr. Pointer's here. He can speak to uh, kind of the plethora of projects across the county that we've identified and that we'll be working to make improvements on if you have any questions. Uh, how long the list is that? Yeah. Pretty good. Okay. I just didn't see it on here tonight. I was just going to glance it over. We can yeah. attach that. Yeah, we can. And since, since that list first appeared in front of you, we've actually met with contractors and walked those sites and gotten realistic numbers, not just budget numbers, but the specifics on what they'll cost for us to do. So, so that's just for your consideration. Okay, Mr. Lindsay. In regards to the lighting projects, um, you said you didn't have that information tonight. Um, if, if you have it by the board meeting, I don't. If, if the board is fine with it, I'm. I mean, it's a cooperative purchase. I, I would be fine personally with us moving ahead with that. And we, we debated on whether to, to put it on there or not. The problem is, we just have to verify through the cooperative that that purchase not just that the vendor says that this pricing is right but that the cooperative verifies that that's the correct number that's the only thing we didn't have and I'll just be honest is because we had so many items on here tonight that we were just chasing our tail this week and didn't get to doing it 
we could have it on there by tomorrow. So if you guys are okay, I can have it on there by the board meeting for sure. And we put it under new business for you to look at. Yeah, as soon as possible. I'd appreciate seeing seeing that. Okay. All right. I'm trying to think of how to say what I want to say, but I can't think of it. So that's probably a good reason not to say it. <laughs> uh, the, if you're ready. Wait a minute. I got one more. Yeah. Mr. Sims. Is, is, is this the money that we approved the two mi two million for athletics and two million for um, maintenance? Maintenance. This that, is the, this is the athletic. That's money. the athletic yeah. money. Okay. And we will track it on one on that first report monthly, even through working through them. We'll give you a monthly cost as to what we've done, when we've done it, and where we're where we're at in that process. All right, let's move on. Next item is just the annual facilities report that we have to provide to you in October. Um, we debated over whether to, to, to display it for you, but it's pretty lengthy. I would go to just a, a couple of things, one page in particular that I want to direct you to um, when you have a chance to go through it is page five. And it's just a spreadsheet that looks at our facilities um, when they were constructed, the square footage, the acreage, I want to point a couple of things out to you. We, you see that kind of at the bottom, McDowell is ghosted, uh, but we did include it because it is still a current facility. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But just so everyone knows, we operate 2.5 million square feet of bu building, uh, and we operate 550 acres that we cover on our campuses. I will say, thankfully, thankful that you guys approved two more maintenance men for us this year, but that that's 30 full-time maintenance men for the county and then our 12 building operators. So with a staff of 42 right now, we're still kind of running through uh, that, that amount of business uh, and land. I would dare say, and this is just me pulling it, probably Saturn plants, the only thing that really um, competes with us on square footage. Uh, and, and I don't even know how big it is. It may not, it, it's got a, a bunch, but you can see we're covering quite a bit. We have your capacity numbers. These are the capacity numbers we've been using for the last couple of years. And enrollment as of 10-19, um, that was actually put in there today. We pulled it and, and there's your actual enrollment that are in our buildings. You can see where our capacities are. What I wanna point you to, and Mr. Moore, I come back to this based off of the conversation a while ago. We put a lot of work into the five year and the 10 year projections spent a lot of time looking at the Dr. Register report, the Belmont report, whatever we want to call it, and how they did it, and really came down and, and broke this down to looking at the growth that we've experienced in our buildings, which in our elementary schools this year was very hard because we changed zones. So you, we look at how many kids we have in our, in our building, but that's not necessarily a reflection of what the last two to three years of that part of town or the county has grown at. So what we did, is we pulled census growth rates for city of Columbia, city of Spring Hill, city of uh, Mount Pleasant, and then Murray County itself. So the schools are divided out and their growth rates are figured over a five and a 10 year period based off of growth rates that reflect both uh, population change within that district and within the municipalities. And you can see that um, we, we figure and you see quite a jump there. Uh, I gave you what the, if the zone remained the same, what the projections hold out that student population would look like in five years and 10 years and what the capacity of that building would look like in five years and 10 years. Please, please know as folks move in, we don't know how many people will choose to homeschool. We don't know how many people will choose to go to Agathos or, or Columbia Academy or Zion or, or anything like that. So what we're basing this on is growth that has is, is been demonstrated, not just in the last census, but in the census before with those rates. And then we've applied it to our student population um, and, and how we see there. It, it bodes out pretty, pretty accurately, I think. I just told you earlier that City of Columbia has 8,300 rooftops. We know the round number for 100 rooftops is 40 kids. It's a little bit lower in City of Columbia. It's like 37, but say 40 is a round number you can use. That's 3,200 kids, depending on how long it takes those homes to be built out, and that's before anything else 
is approved and we know that if from going to the meetings they're they're coming in in large numbers so we tried to do this look at the growth that's there some are going to be hot spots that are, that are the true numbers not going to hold out spring hills multiplier is much higher than mount pleasant um, and then you have to divide really some of our schools are in columbia but you know i always talk to you about bear creek north well cox and Howe fall into bear creek north so their multiplier probably is more like city of spring hills than city of columbia's but we use city of columbia and murray county for that so we're trying to keep up with where those growths are when we come back for five-year plan we'll go more in depth we're, we're talking about trying to it, it's been interesting i think mr hickman will tell you as we meet with the city of columbia specifically because we've spent the most time with them and how they talk about growth and centers that they're trying to plan out just outside of the square but where's our next population center where's our next business center where's our next so we're working through and um, I hope that when we look back in time you look back we look back and say those numbers were pretty accurate but it's always contingent upon rezoning some of this will tell us that we need to rezone some schools sooner rather than later because we're going to see them come in near capacity uh, and you can see that um, as 10 years out there's a lot of building that needs to be done five years out um, you still see Spring Hill High School um, you see Battle Creek Elementary rapidly increasing compared to the others. Uh, Cullioca jumps off that page, and then Baker as well. And I'll tell you, those are known hot spots. The other one that's really a hot spot is going to be Randolph Howell and Cox, and so we're looking at that. But that kind of feeds back to the conversation we were having earlier. I hope that you spend some time looking through. The facilities report has information from, from uh, Murray Alliance. It has information that we've collected from the state. Uh, but if I had to encapsulate the importance of it for us practically moving forward, this is probably the, the page that we look at and say we need to spend the most time being aware of. So we can answer any questions over any part of the report. I know it was late getting on there for you to have time to go through 62 pages. So I would hope when we get to um, the, the board meeting, if you have questions, shoot them to me before the meeting and we can specifically be prepared for those questions but I mean we'll we'll take it from the hip that night too if you want to talk about it but I do hope you spend some time working through there okay thank you very much seeing no questions or comments we'll move on uh, the the policy that's listed next is actually a policy that I've been working on mr. Ard has been working on it with me the last few days and, and we can answer questions this came up well back into the summer when we were first asked to look at uh, facility use um, in our in our buildings and how groups come into our buildings if some of you remember multiple of you were were at Central High School for the Columbia dance um, when they had their recitals over there and, and some of the questions came up then so what we did was take policy 3.206 and really start gathering information from counties that are like us and when I say that I always try to go to counties that are around us because obviously that's that's a very similar demographic in some respects um, obviously Williamson's the one that everybody always says hi oh, what do they do but we looked at Rutherford we looked at Wilson we looked at uh, Sumner we looked at Robertson and Putnam those are metro type counties and it pains me to say we kind of fall into that metro type group now but then like Robertson is very comparable to us in size uh, and they're a little bit out of Nashville so what we've done is gone through this policy and the policy that we had was just the generic TSBA policy the one that they say hey here's the policy that meets everything by law you're supposed to do it doesn't violate anything and you can work within the parameters of it and so what we did was we went in and tried to make it more specific to the things that we were dealing with then we attached a procedure to this that a lot of the information is not necessarily policy information it's procedure information and I say like pricing on facilities that's a procedural thing you don't change policy to change the price but we can bring that request to you on a procedure and you can say yeah and then you don't have to work through policy and posting in 30 days and all that it's just something that we've done so we tried to clean up the policy that we had and tried really to do two things be fair to the groups that that want to utilize our buildings but come back and protect your interests and that was and, and the school 
systems interest, one of the things that the big changes is on there that we are going to now is a complete verification on a 403C uh, status. And then, not that you couldn't go through it, but there's gonna be a process. The other thing is saying that Murray County groups and Murray County um, entities use Murray County buildings. You don't just come from another county because we're cheaper than them. And, and I'll say specifically, Spring Hill Middle School is our most requested facility. It's close to Williamson County and it's cheap compared to what's up there. And we have more issues with renters at Spring Hill Middle School than we do the entire district combined because those are folks that are not part of our community. That building is not seen as a asset of the community and of the people in it. It is just a building that's cheap that we can get into and we can use. Uh, and so we tried to, if you go through the policy, build in protections, uh, not that someone ever couldn't use it. Obviously we've got Supreme Court about to do a big project, the Tennessee Supreme Court would be a project at Central next month still would allow them in as a government entity. We still would make those waves, but we wouldn't just have a, a youth uh, sports program in Williamson County that's a for-profit program showing up wanting to use our facilities and then being very demanding uh, when we did that. So we've gone through, I've provided for you multiple documents, four documents actually, the current 3.206, a red line to one, um, that shows you the uh, all of the changes that we made, then a clean one that's just the new one so you could read it, and then the procedures um, that we wrote to accompany um, the, the policy. So uh, I know Ms. Parker specifically had questions about this and was the one that initially bro brought it up. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to her and make sure she, any questions she has on this are cleared up. But as you go through this, and as you go through this, again, if you'll shoot me any questions and, and we can clear up anything that you have a question about, hopefully before time to, to get to a, a voting meeting. I want to ask about the rate increases. Mm -hmm. Where I know you said you looked at other areas around us. How does this compare to what the cleaning actually costs versus the raises that are in here? So, so you'll see that right above the chart in the procedure that shows you the, the rates that we applied to the building. Uh, we actually just mentioned custodial services and we gave two options. We found this to be the most common practice across districts is that if you are the outside group, you can take on full responsibility for making our building back <coughs> student ready uh, at your cost. You can, you can pay your people to clean it uh, but we put language in there that, you know, we're not providing the materials for this and we're not providing the people. When they do that and they sign up for that through Facilitron, we will make future usage conditional on uh, them doing that. One of the things we're also doing is working on a site supervisor uh, procedure that would take that site supervisor and make sure that they don't just leave, they verify that garbage was not stacked up beside the garbage can, it was actually taken to the compactor and put in the compactor. The second option is that they pay us and they contract through us for either ABM or HES to do the cleaning. And you can see that we put a, a flat 150 charge on that cleaning and, and we feel like in most every case, and I mean very rarely, uh, would anybody incur more than $150 in cleaning. Probably our biggest uh, renter is the Bridge Church at Central and they've talked to us about taking that cleaning on themselves. So we feel like that 150 would cover everything. Um, we obviously would waive that for groups like the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, but in most cases we feel that that's a very, and, and what we did was we found that when we talked to other districts, the flat cleaning fee was much more uh, efficient for them uh, and they weren't having to go back and, and bill later on that, hey, we actually had seven hours of cleaning and, and they said, you know, sometimes you're $10 over, sometimes you're $10 under, but in the end it all worked out. So, okay, plus, plus and, and I'm sorry, folks know what the actual cost is gonna be when they sign up for it. Walk me through the price increases on this chart, please. Yes, so what we did was we, in this, our recommendation to you was to look at per 
facility. Right now, it's just a flat thing. You can rent the whole building. We don't designate it. You come in, now we can designate you're going to be in the auditorium, but technically you can, you could rent the entire building at Baker for the same price you rent one classroom. So what we looked at is some of our larger renters, such as the churches, use multiple facilities, uh, multiple rooms. So we came in, looked at what other districts are doing, and said this is, we're going to break down by the type of facility you're in. Uh, you see site supervisor, which is $20.50 per hour. That would cover everything. That's not what that supervisor would make, but that covers all of the benefits and the taxes that we have to pay out for that. Classrooms are just a $25 a day. Currently, again, you pay, if you want one classroom, you have to pay the whole fee that you would pay to get the, the gym. So we made it a 25 per day with a 25 maximum. Auditorium is 275 per day. We find that cleaning in our auditoriums is our most expensive ex um, endeavor that we get into. Um, the auditorium at Central has carpet, the auditorium at Spring Hill Middle has carpet, and we have to spend a good bit of money sometimes just cleaning up, regardless of the rules that we've given them about no food, no beverages. When they have an open recital or something like that, people have it in their purse and it ends up being a mess. Let, let me cut you off right there because mm -hmm. I, I think I heard something that kind of changes my question. We had not previously been charging per area used, correct? What was the flat fee? $150. Okay. And then what on top of that would increase that fee, Cleaning say fee. for a church? Cleaning fee. Okay. Uh, that would be billed later on through them because we built through Facilitron so we could build back. Uh, we do have a site supervisor fee that comes through there. <laughs> I will say this, probably what I have been, and we've talked about this all the way back when we were on Zoom meetings when we were talking about COVID, probably the, the biggest issue we've run into is that lots of principals have taken the liberty they currently have just to waive all the fees and so uh, they approve something in facilitron with all the fees waived they recommend it for all the fees waived and then we spend two hundred dollars cleaning up and they've already signed the thing of facilitron saying that fees were waived so what we're trying to do is come in and give a specific and then make it to where only you guys would be the ones that would waive fees as we brought them well here, here's my concern i got an email this afternoon i'm not going to go off of just one instance but i think this could be emblematic of other things this obviously some churches have no problem paying these fees right. uh, i have a church here that emailed me they spend currently 290 dollars a week mm -hmm. for our facility under the new plan they will be paying or being asked to pay 712 dollars per week so i'm confused as I just think we're doing a disservice to maybe some groups who can't use can't make that happen so what and again this is this is just being brought to you but what we found is this most every district that our size or larger wants to motivate people to go find their own building uh, at some point and and that what we find is that some groups tend to move in and not leave um, and that what we end up with is that over time the wear and tear that they do on paint as they pull out truckloads of things and as they tear up and the waxing of the floor as they pull in three to four trailers or in some cases of of uh, baptismals and of their own stands and curtains and lights that get hit with bars and tape that has to be removed from walls we incur all of that cost uh, and so so what we looked at was being comparable to other now i will tell you marshall county doesn't charge you anything you want to use school in marshall county you call them and if you get permission they don't cost you anything but what we really looked at is we're bringing back to you that we hope that those buildings would be student ready when they leave and uh, and obviously this is a recommendation on the procedure we can change it to whatever you want it to be. I do think that in many cases right now we're coming out upside down and lots of folks are getting really cheap rent yeah, and that's in our what facilities. I, that's what I want to add. You, the amount of square footage that we're letting them use, you, they won't, even at the price you just quoted uh, per week, you won't find any square footage you can rent. 
for cheaper than that in this town. And that's why he was saying a lot of folks bleed over from Williamson County because they know how cheap it is here. I'd be willing to bet that number comes a little closer to what it would actually be when you consider the tax increases that have been levied to pay for these buildings. Um, that's my big concern with this is um, I'll go on record and say if this stands and we go with this kind of a raise, I'll never vote for a tax increase for a school because I see this as counterproductive to making that argument that these benefit the community when we're pricing the community out of being able to help uh, enjoy these buildings. If you do go into the policy itself, you will see that we've outlined for each type of group that there is, whether they be um, nonprofit, whether they be any other type of group, that there are conditions that would be in there. That is just the pay scale that we brought that would be contingent upon if you were raising money and you were running a tournament through our gym, those types of things. So you can, we can go through, we can adjust the number to where you want to be, but we felt like the numbers that we brought back were very comparable to numbers that we saw in other districts. And again, and, and, and I'm just going to say, my whole look at this is we have to protect the interest of the school and, and the budget that we're working in. And if we're losing money in our 141 to, to clean and paint and re-wax because we let a group come in, we're the one losing the money. So, so we're, we're, I'm good with if you want to uh, give someone for us to work with to come up with a cost that would be more comparable, we can do that. We can, we can go back to the flat fee. Uh, the flat fee we didn't feel was really fair because if you need one room, it's the same as if you need another. But we, we can come back and, and come to some sort of look at that however you want to. This was just our starting point based off of what we've been asked to do. I'd rather move closer to Marshall County than Williamson County. <laughs> Mr. Howe. So I, I am a very uh, community-oriented person. I'm a, I, I, I think that these buildings belong to the community. I mean, taxpayer dollars built them. Um, so I, I, I like the part of the policy where it, it specifically states these are four groups or in Murray County. I specifically, I really, I really like that. Uh, but I do have some concerns. I mean, so um, as most people know, I'm an Eagle Scout. Austin's an Eagle Scout too. Um, so I have used Cullioka School Building numerous times for various things, whether it be for uh, monthly pack meetings where we'll have, depending on the pack, um, I mean, you know, 20 to 50 kids in the cafeteria and we'll often use an auxiliary gym and we get approval for all of that, of course, or have in the past. Um, so, you know, if I'm looking at it, I mean, I've got to have a site supervisor that I paid $20 an hour for. Um, I've got to have $150 for the auxiliary gym, and then we meet in the cafeteria, so that's $20 per hour for the cafeteria itself. Uh, no, there's no way that a Cub Scout pack could do that. Uh, I, I understand it could be waived. I'm just using that as, an, as a for instance. Um, then you want to go on to, you know, just we have weekly DIN meetings where it's, you know, a, a level of fourth grade that, that, you know, it may be 10 in a DIN, you know, and they meet monthly or weekly. Um, sometimes every two weeks, but so you, you've got these people, th these are students in these classes anyways, um, in these schools anyways, uh, you know, and you're asking $25 a day, and I'm assuming that the, the super site fee or super supervisor would be still there as well, right? So, can so if he's in a classroom, and then I'm using... Yeah, but... Well, hold on, I'm just... just I think I'll give I you can answer what you're going to say, though. So, I mean, what I'm getting at is that that becomes very, I mean, it's just like you're saying, it becomes very cost prohibitive for a den who doesn't raise money. They don't make money. Um, and, and, you know, arguably whether you want to say it or not, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of this road when they become Boy Scouts, they provide services to the community. They do community service. They build projects that better our schools. And so ultimately... That's the kind of thing you want to promote. You want to promote community. Um, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but I, you know, you site supervisor is mandatory. Well, it says mandatory. I kind of think that if I was looking at this, 
on the outside not being in here, I'd be like, well, I can't afford this to meet here. So I always had a site supervisor, if you want to call it that, whether it be a, a, usually it was a teacher that was a parent or somebody that I recruited as a leader. So I was fortunate to do that. So I always had a site supervisor there. Uh, I didn't pay them. We didn't, we didn't pay them. Um, they were just volunteers. But uh, so I just, that's the kind of thing I, I want to make sure that we're removing that barrier because these buildings are paid for. The wear and tear, in my scenario, that's the kids that go to these schools. You know, they, you know, they, they're going to generally, generally, they're going to respect those schools because they respect them all day long. The, the biggest thing that I see, and I want to make this point, there's two types of renters. There are Cub Scout groups and community groups that just need a, a place to have an event. And then there are people who move into your building because it's cheaper than building their own, buying their own, or renting their own building. If, if you read through this entire policy and procedure, there is still leeway for this board to say, we don't, we don't charge Cub Scouts. That, that leeway is there for you to do that for-profit groups that want to, and, and look, we can say sometimes we're non-profit, but our goal is to raise a whole lot of money and we need your gym at Central High School all day from Friday night till Sunday evening because we're gonna make as much money as we can and we're gonna bring in all these AAU groups. Those aren't Murray County taxpayers that are in our building and that's not the general reason that they're doing it. If you want to have church in our building, and, and look, I'm going to come off sounding real bad right here, because it's cheaper than buying your own building, that's not a taxpayer benefit. You don't get to have church in the memorial building because it's cheaper than building a building. Those are entities that are used. I mean, we have a church in our building right now that couldn't pay their rent. And they're back in our building because it's a cheap place to be. And I'm not, look, they're great. I'm not, I'm not knocking that, but when, from the, from the school standpoint, when we look at that, you know, they take sometimes lots of liberties. We say you're there for church, and then we find out they had a fish fry in the back parking lot because, oh, we were having church. And we put 47,000 things from our, our project cleanup. We just brought them and stuffed them in your dumpster because there's a dumpster at church, which is school. Um, though there's two very different groups and if you read through this what this does is still give this board the the ability to say you can use this if the school wants to use it if a, if a civic club wants to use it if a government entity wants to use it we're very open to that and we can waive fees we can do that but if you're just using our building because we're cheap we are incurring costs to maintain a building that those entities are benefiting from uh, because we're cheap. I, I go to the Memorial Building, there's a cost associated that they don't rent out the courthouse. So while these are public buildings, w the argument of you just get to use it because it's a public building, well, we don't get to go to the post office and have a banquet in the lobby. And so a lot of people look at us and say, was the school we paid for it well, we pay for lots of stuff but what we're trying to do is bring to you a policy and a procedure that still allows those groups to use it but that it protects basically our 141 in the long run so I, I understand exactly what you're saying what I'm saying is I don't I don't want long-term renters we're not in that business I don't you mind. Just, if, I don't, if you could get them to agree with you, you'd make me the happiest yeah. person in the room. I, I, I don't mind a startup church or someone starting out or, or temporary, you know, they, their, their building flooded or whatever, coming in. I don't have a problem with that. Maybe we should limit the, the long term renter. Maybe we say, I understand you want to meet here, but, you know, you can meet here 36 times or whatever, and, and that's it, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. I just want to make sure that these buildings are community buildings. They're open to the community. There's one courthouse. It's in. It's right here. We have 23 that are uh, facilities that are all across our county in communities that, that that use these buildings. And I want to encourage that because that's what it, they're for. 
that they're to be used. I don't want them to be sit there and be vacant. I would rather them be used with community groups and organizations using them. Like I said, long-term renters, that's uh, <laughs> for-profit renters, those are all different stories. I, I don't, but I do want this to be sure that we are available to our community. And, and I hope that as you, as, if you read through this, that, that we've addressed those, those issues in there. And, and again, the fee schedule that's on there, I'm happy to sit down with you guys as a group, or if you want a representative to come work with us on, on a fee for that. What we're really looking at are that diff, that second type of group that really is, is using the building because, and, and I mean, what we find is we're cheap. You know, we're having state level beauty pageants at Spring Hill Middle School, and when you flat out ask, why are you at Spring Hill having a beauty? We can't afford anywhere else. You're the cheapest building around. And then we fight lots of issues in make sure, you know, maintaining that relationship, making sure that the facilities are left right. Um, we've got a church that completely overrides um, our, our, our control system in, in the auditorium. We find things, Tommy will tell you, we find things plugged into walls all the time that a church just decided, hey, we're putting our own little network in here uh, our own boosters because this is where we go to church. And, and you know, that, that is, and, and look, I'm coming off sounding really anti-church right now, and I don't mean to, <laughs> but, but from an operational standpoint, that, that's, it, it, it's an issue that we fight weekly in my office, making sure that, that things are done and that, that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to by, by them and by y'all too. I'll say that I am in favor of keeping it within Murray County renters and nonprofits. Uh, I don't know too many nonprofit beauty pageants, though, so I think they would oh, be. Oh, they're all for, they all have nonprofit pageants. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they all they have it, do. I promise. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Sims. Appreciate you bringing this because on the previous schedule, I was one that was for sure thought we were too cheap. And honestly, when I looked at this, when I was going through this, I thought this was still too cheap. I feel like we are, even with these numbers, at the end of the day, they're not going to pay for these large groups coming into our buildings. Um, if if you think that we're okay with these numbers, I, I'll, I'll, I will vote and support this. But honestly, I came in here tonight to say, hey, I think it needs to be higher than this. Um, I have great friends that go to the Bridge Church, but they have a $10 million building in Spring Hill. Well, even if they pay 1000 a week at ours, that's they don't have motivation to go anywhere. And and like I said, not not a knock on them. That's just that's just that's they've been brought up and like I said, I have great friends that go and there. And I will say they it's, they've been great to work with. So let me get on the record okay. as I've yeah, and, and everybody. That's what I, they've like, been really good to to work with. But I'm I'm just using that as, as an example. There there is no motivation for them to want to go anywhere else. And that that's okay, I guess, but if we're if we have a person there, if if they're heavily using our facilities, water, power, we have insurance still, uh, liability of them being in our buildings, I'm 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 on board for even more. Just to be honest, one thing just to say is that sometimes when we sign long-term agreements, um, and again, look, I'm not bashing that 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 is our largest renter, so sometimes things come to a head the fastest. We oftentimes have to work volleyball tournaments and basketball tournaments that the school is helping to put on as a fundraiser or that type of thing around the schedule that, that they have to be in because they're in the building for a certain amount of time. Uh, and then their breakdown and their setup has to be in the building. And, and that's not just with them, but sometimes we do find that, you know, we, we have to run school events um, when we get into long-term agreements around um, those those groups, whereas if it's a an event, we can designate and say, no, the, the school's already using the building that day. You can't be in there, and that's easier to do one time or two times than it is if we say, you're you know, you've got a year to 
you know, we're, we're saying on this a year at most, and then it comes up for a renewal. Um, the bridge right now signed a five-year agreement, you know, um, several years ago. They find the, uh, a five-year contract with, with the former administration, and, and we're, we're kind of locked into that. And so, um, you know, it, it creates an issue that you just know, you know, we've got to schedule everything we're doing around these hours no matter what's going on. Prom, we have a prom on Saturday night. We've got to get cleaned up no matter what because church is coming in on Sunday and they're paying to use our building. Um, and those are, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes staff would probably rather go home and come back and do it another time, but that's, that's kind of how we have to work that. Thank you. Um, I would just, you know, I know there's some differences in this. I'd probably go with Mr. Shims. I think these numbers are a little low, having spent a whole lot of money on, on rent myself on buildings through the last few years. Um, they look a little low to me as well. So I just, I'm happy that we are, and I read, I did read through both of these, and I really like the language in the policy that, that starts to talk about how the goal is not to make money. That's not what we're here to do, but we are here to make sure we're protecting our interests, and I think that's the right direction. I know a couple of years ago we went through this and we, when we looked at the pricing for out of out of county students, for example, and, and we had just some random numbers originally. I don't know if anybody recalls that. And then we started to look at what the actual costs were, and we had to make some adjustments. So I'm happy to see that we're making some adjustments to make sure we cover our cost. And to be honest, there may be some things we tweak with this as we go. I mean, it's probably not perfect right off the bat. I think it's a great start personally, and I think we're heading the right direction to make sure that our interests. Um, I don't, I don't want to cut things off to the public either, but I definitely we we can't afford. Listen. We were just talking about the difficulties that we have with pay, with other issues. We can't afford to be paying to clean up after somebody else with, with those dollars because we're going to have to make sure we're maximizing every dollar we've got. Uh, and, and again, that's not to make money. That's just to make sure we're not losing money on those things. The public can still have access to these things. We just can't be you know, basically funding those um, because we've got plenty of other needs that we've got to take care of. Remember, we just, we just argued about uh, needing money for some textbooks, for example. Uh, and if we're having to pay thousands of dollars a year to clean up after different groups, we need to make sure that they're covering their costs and that we're not covering that, and then we can use our funds where we desperately need to use them. So I think this is a great start. I'm happy to see us move in this direction. Hopefully we can continue to refine it uh, as needed to make sure that those groups that we really want in there are maybe some waves, some fees, scouts, or whatever else needs to be done. We can work through the details of that. And, and I would say, too, the policy – and. The fee schedule, that's the reason we put it in procedure. Um, the policy, I would hope you look at it as, as a policy, and then the, the fee schedule you know, on a procedure, I mean, we can hold until, you, until we all agree upon what we're doing, until we, we implement that part of it. We just wanted to make sure, and we've talked about this in the past, that a, a policy like this that has lots of uh, conditions that we showed you a procedure on the front end so that you just didn't understand you know you just weren't taking our word that hey we're gonna make sure this happens but we were giving you actual rules that went through with that uh, I think we got to keep in mind that our main purpose is to educate kids and um, if, if, uh, if other things can fit in with that then and I'm all for it um, I, my biggest sticking point is, is the is the long term uh, renters, <coughs> and, and I guess I come from a little different angle. Um, I look at it a, as an equal opportunity across the county with with any group. Um, you know, my, if if the AC goes out at my church, and and I need a t you know. My group of people need a need a temporary place to meet, but we can't because it's tied up with someone who it's become their home. Then that I just see that as as a problem. Um, and as far as facility use, I, I, I've been a proponent and, and told many people that uh, when it comes to athletic facilities, uh, w we need to allow. Uh, youth groups, whomever, to use those facilities as much as we can, uh, just because the price of those facilities, you know, we, we have, and I say this all the time, I, and I'm a baseball guy, but we have baseball fields that sit empty all summer long, uh, nobody uses them, and then in my line of work, I'll, I'll have people tell me, well, we need more baseball fields, and I always say, well, you have this field and this field and this field that sit empty all year, so 
what we what we need as a community is a user agreement that you know user X can use Mount Pleasant High School baseball field uh, rather than putting that burden on a taxpayer to go out and, and, and build more facilities. But uh, Mr. Wilbur, Mr. Paramer brought up a point, um, and I know it sounds like we're beating on one group, but a contract that was signed by an administrator that no longer is an administrator, can, can they, are we bound by that? Honestly, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Um, yes and no. I mean, you, you've got some agency there. Uh, should should have been signed? Probably not. I mean, without your approval going that far over that many fiscal years, no. I mean, it shouldn't have. Um, honestly, I, I couldn't say. I'd look at it, but um, he was your agent when he signed it, so they've got some reliance rights there, but for five years, I think that goes beyond, I mean, I just, I don't see that that would be binding on you for that long a time, but I, I don't know that you want to pick that fight, but, you know, that's the other side of it is, I, I just don't see how you could be expected to be bound for five years. So, uh, and so along those lines, I would, I would like to see to the proposed, um, um, I like I like the proposed policy, but I would like to put some hard numbers in there that say that, and, and you guys can word this a lot better than I can. But but that this is a temporary thing, and and put a number on it that you outside users can use our facilities x number of times. I and I just think that that and, and it appears not just I have that same have that feeling, but that long-term users, long-term renters, it, I, I just don't think that's not our, uh, that's not our niche. I, and, and I don't think that would should be our niche for any public building because we, we have 103,000 people or whatever that live in Murray County now. Uh, we, we, all 103,000 of those get to pay for those tax increases. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that we should allow just one group of people to eat up the majority of the use of a facility. I will point out in the policy on on the back second page there or I don't I'm looking at the at the corrected page where it's in red under number five lease of facilities. Um, we did say beginning under D beginning with any new lease or lease after January 1st 2022 an organization or entity may request a Lisa Murray County School facility for up to one year with mo no more than four additional renewals. I will tell you that as yesterday that said one year with two renewals and um, I had um, I had several people in my office kind of say well and I said oh, okay I, I, I can give to that because y'all are going to have to approve it and look at it anyway but I did have it limited. I had them only being able to a six month that could only be renewed for a total of three years because I, I, I found during COVID that doing six month blocks on our side was better in our interest. Now I understand for those groups they would rather secure it for a year and we didn't have anyone we didn't re-up in six months but given the COVID issue you know we talked about can people go to church when we can't go to school. Uh, and, and that was why I kind of had six months in there. So that specifically changed yesterday uh, just through conversation in our office. But uh, my, my suggestion would be not that, and I hope I'm not out of, not necessarily that y'all vote on this at the board meeting, but this is a, a talking point that maybe th if we come back next month at a work session and we've had time for you guys to email questions and concerns and clarities and we can talk through it again if you need to. This was the first time anyone laid eyes on it. If you want to vote on it, I'm good with that. But um, it's it's a pretty big policy lengthy wise. All right, Mr. Moore. So I guess I personally I like the idea of that, um, I, and I, I didn't see in there the language. How do you differentiate between a weekly user, I guess, or versus 
someone that still would be annually using it, but only for a shorter period of time, I guess. Is, is there any way to differentiate that inside the, the policy itself? We, we don't look at, let's say you're going to have a Pinewood Derby every April. Yeah. That's a one-time event. We don't necessarily okay. look at you as a leaser. I mean, I guess, that would be the concern. So yeah. I would just be where I'm going with that is, is my, my gut would be, I don't see why anybody should be using any of our facilities for more than two consecutive years. I'm just going to throw a number out there. Um, and that's using the same thing over and over again, week after week, for two years. Um, that's just, just where I would be. But that said, I just want to make sure there's no way that, that by doing that, you wouldn't be limiting that, uh, that Pinewood Derby that is every April or wherever, whenever it would be, that you would be cutting that out because that is also every year. I just don't know how you, what language you would put in place to make sure that you're not uh, cutting that out at the same time as the other if you're trying to put in a, in a limitation. Um, but I think that's probably the, the going back to the you know two year time or whatever maybe it's a one year with a one year renewal. I think it would be something the rest of the board need to kind of discuss of what we feel like is a reasonable long term use of of our facilities. Um, I don't know what everybody's probably got a little different opinion of that. I was hoping Mr. Lindsay would share what, exactly what he thought his was. I mean, that's just kind of where our mind is is is, a, is that two year mark, uh, a twelve month with a <coughs> an additional twelve month renewal. But after that. I'm of the opinion that I think uh, we just shouldn't be homes for, for places for that long. We should be a place that I, I like the idea of what you said, that multiple places should be able, multiple groups should be able to use, serving more of the community rather than just the people that are able to lock in a big agreement. All right. So I think that we're bumping this to the next month's work session from the sounds of it. We'll take it back up then. Other business? Instructional low bids, Mr. Kane. So the first one is for Imagine Learning, and that's for ESL. If you have any questions about it, you can uh, talk to Ms. Ventura. ACT testing. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed it. That's just the, the routine agreement that we do every year for ACT testing. Okay. Consent on both of those? Okay. The third one, ready uh, reading? Our ready reading, we're going to remove that at this time. We wanted to purchase that, but uh, we were trying to find a vendor. Uh, we were trying to be able to purchase it through a co-op, and we are unable to find that, so we're going to have to do a RFP. So we're going to take that off at this time, All unless right. we find unless we find one. But at this point, we haven't found one. But if we do find one, we'll put the item on there. If not, we will remove it. Okay. All right. Over twenty-five thousand for operations. Uh, the first thing that's listed there, four point two one zero, um, was the sale of the McDowell property. You guys know from from the email that was sent last week, we did not have a bid on that property i will say apparently no selling something generates more interest than anything else we could do because uh, lots of people are interested in it now um, um, the process i think is what we needed to talk to you guys tonight about um, what you want to do moving forward if, it, if it's to sell the property uh, then we do have to repost it um, with a, a new minimum um, i think doug said Doug, would it be 10 days minimum, or we would have to go back to 30? 10 days is the minimum. So, so we would that would be for discussion. I will say, um, we, I think, maybe more than just me, have been contacted for for discussion back with uh, some governmental entities again for the property and and what it could be used for. Um, but it's really back to the board as to what we or what you want to do moving forward with this property. I say go through the process. I mean, that's my opinion, go through the process again. And, and, and I will say, I would defer to Jake to say, that is really our only option is to go back and post it as, as an open bid again, because it, you know, I, I've had a request to present a contract, uh, that someone wants to present a contract on it, but I think it would have to be through an open bid process, and that's the only way we could do this. Yeah, that a reserve price. 
the we had the million on there so I mean it, that would probably I, I do think that's probably the obstacle that was there um, for for what we think it is I, I'll say everybody knows that the building is the issue um, you know if it were an open lot you I think we'd have come closer to getting bids than it is a lot with that building sitting on it so just if we want to have a discussion about reestablishing a minimum or if you want to talk about that at a voting meeting um, <laughs> and I'm, we I'm, don't have to have a minimum it I, can I'm just sorry, be for sale we, we have a board member that is just dying to say I told you so I can't imagine who that would be I guess is that something we need to, we don't need to decide that tonight we can decide that at the voting meeting okay Mr. Moore, thank you. I can discuss it. I, I would just, the motion I made in the first place, I'd just bring that back up with the half a million dollar minimum. Okay, so let's bring that up the voting meeting then. Oh, Mr. Lindsay? I would just say if we're going to sell it, don't put a minimum on it. It's going to bring what it's going to bring. I mean, it's a bid process. It, it, if, if it's worth $700,000 to me, I don't care what the minimum is. I'm, I'm going to give you what I'm going to give you. And that, that, was, that was my fear when we put the million dollar on it. What if somebody was willing to give $950,000 for it? And we missed that. We didn't capture that person because we stuck a million dollar number on it. I mean, it, 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 it's worth what it's worth to me. What you tell me it's worth doesn't mean a thing to me. Uh, so I, I, my suggestion would be if this, if this is the way this board wants to go, then we just put it up and we take bids on it and if, if we still have to approve that bid uh, is my understanding if if it comes in at at the highest bid we get a hundred thousand dollars and we don't want to take that we, we can vote to not take that and go a different direction if, I mean, if you want to if you want to list it with final approval of the board you're gonna have to specify that in the in the uh, bid advertisement uh, that'd be my only concern there if, if it's going to come back to you uh, otherwise, there's going to be a contract sign because you're turning over to the person uh, or the budget office to make the sale. So, um, yeah, we just we need to we need to work through that at the at the meeting if that's something you're interested in. Is no minimum, but but come back to you guys for approval. More, Sorry, Mr. I, Moore. I'll just dive back into. It. So part of the reason that where I had originally in my head set my my bid minimum was that. In my opinion, I mean, although I do want to get rid of the liability there, there are there is some value to that property, even to the school system, um, in various ways as as a tool and in various forms, or just as real property itself. So I mean, I mean, I, I'm not randomly just throwing a number out there. I think there is some value, and I think it's worthwhile for each of us as board members to kind of consider maybe what that is to us um, a, as we set a minimum. Um, although I do like the uh, just throw it out there and let it go. The part of me likes that, but I'm, I realize too that we may have some value there if, if we, um, worst come to worst, that we wanted to s sit on that property, we had to keep that property, we could find uses for it, and that does have value for us. So I, I just would say we should each kind of consider what that is as we as we look at what that that number may need to be. All right, so we'll move that to new business for the meeting. Vehicle purchases. Uh, Four point two point two is a vehicle for technology. Mr. Schuyler's here. Uh, to speak to this and this is money that they've been able to uh, scrape together because they are not supporting McDowell this year um, so I'll let him go into further detail on that you literally said everything I was going to say so I'm here to <laughs> answer any questions you guys have Ms. Kinzer I, you're purchasing it in Wilson County did I read that right that's the state the state contract it's the state contract yeah okay Mr. Lindsay, why why a small truck? Why Colorado? You cannot get anything. So this we have a new employee starting tomorrow. If you try to order anything full size from anybody right now, it's impossible. Literally, we had them call and they said this is the biggest thing you're going to get. Actually, with you know with Snowmageddon we had last year, we went four wheel drive. This is it. We could be waiting an amount. Un, 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 they wouldn't even give me a timeline. So if you tried to order a full size Chevy 2022. They won't even do it, so you can't even do it. So this is the best we could do for now. We have employees starting tomorrow and then two more next Wednesday. We don't have vehicles. All right, so I'm going to get on my soapbox again. Yep. Why Chevrolet? State contract, state contract. But yeah. state contract also is a Dodge. 
from the dealership that sits in Columbia, Tennessee. So when when we keep things common, so the other vehicles we have are Chevy. When we take them in, they keep oil filters. They keep stuff that's common. It's the same engine, just a bigger cab. So we, I, I love you, but that's not a good answer. I, it's, it's honest answer. They, uh, it's honest answer. They they've had they do have two of these Colorados that they have found because they're rarely hauling large items they're they're taking computers and different things that they uh they've been sufficient gas mileage is good on them um and, and we we were able to get those through um last year and it was just staying consistent with that when you when you look at state bid price on vehicles and this is where i'm coming from i, I, I hope you didn't i'm no no up, it's right oh uh, but you get a full-size vehicle four-wheel drive four-door crew cab for just a few thousand more dollars you're not wrong. And I, I, I just, I'm just looking down the road that, you know, I, well, I, I, won't, I won't tell the story, but, but there may come a time you need four people to ride in it, and you're four people my size not going <laughs> to ride very comfortably in that truck. So, uh, so we you to know now why I drive a, a larger truck, right? We ready to, do we put this on consent? Okay. All right. Uh, I will say that you're not hauling uh, boats and campers with they this. Are. You don't need a, anything huge. And uh, I if I'm not mistaken, isn't Chevrolet owned by uh, that big company that sits in the north side of our county? Okay. Just throwing that out there. I will say that last time that question came up, we, we bought one of those vehicles made up there at the north side of the county. We, tr we tried to support that. All right. Go ahead. Uh, 4.2.3.1 and 4.2.3.2 are, are really tied together. We had budgeted this year $80,000 to buy a chipper. I know that doesn't sound in the educational world as the most important thing, but I told you we have 550 acres. The two maintenance men that we just hired, we have assigned to outdoor duties. We have a, a crew of three right now that are doing our playgrounds and our properties. Right now, anything that we cut, we are having to haul and throw in the sinkhole behind uh, Joseph Brown Elementary School. And we are sometimes making multiple trips from Battle Creek, from Marvin Wright, to, from Spring Hill, all over hauling that material and just disposing of it. This has been a, uh, a request of Mr. Um, of Murray for, for quite a while that he feels like this will save us money in the long run because we're not driving back and forth. This is a new uh, chipper uh, that's bought off of a source well contract. It's a diesel, a little bit heavier than the others. It's $43,000. Um, that was our, our original ask was a chipper and, and a used backhoe. Uh, we got into the used backhoe building uh, um, market and found out that for about $40,000, this was what we had budgeted, um, you're buying other folks' junk. Um, and, I mean, the best one we found had rear seals leaking and the hydraulic lines need to be replaced and the brakes don't work and the lights don't work on it, and that was $37,000. Uh, so we looked at what does it cost to just buy a new one, the one that we have right now is a 1984 model that was bought in 1997 as a used piece of equipment. So I will say that for our maintenance staff, they take good care of things and they can hold things together. We Last spring, you guys allowed us to buy a skid loader with a six-foot bush hog on it. And I think if you've been to Battle Creek, if you've been to Central to Cox, you'll see the good work that we're doing with it. And we think it's going to hold up a long time. So we priced a new backhoe. Um, and it is off of a state contract. You can see there it's, it's over $100,000. Um, what we did was sit down and look real hard at um, our maintenance budget, and we feel that if we, we manage our, our funds correctly through the 499 line for the rest of the year, we can take the difference um, that we are lacking in, in uh, equipment money in 717, move it from 499, and we'll still be able to do everything we should be able to do uh, we just have to be very diligent with what we're doing. Uh, but we feel the same thing. In the long run, this new piece of equipment will save us more money and more time than we've had anywhere. Uh, when we were working on the Hampshire sewer, we blew a hydraulic line in the middle of everything. and that, that So it's a big ask, uh, but we can cover it out of the maintenance budget and not move any money from anywhere else. This doesn't take any money. We're not asking for fund balance on this. 
uh, but we can we can cover it in house, and it's very much needed. Let me uh, just ask a quick question. The uh, wood that would be chipped is that reusable it throughout is. the district? Do we do the playgrounds in that, or do we do something else? Not we can't use that That's on the what playground. I thought you we could we could use it around around well, for trees. other landscaping yeah, purposes. We just can't use it on playgrounds. Okay, thank you. All right, consent for this. All right, consent it is. Thank you. Renewal of ASP contract. This is a contract that allows us to do repairs for ASUS. It's no money. No, there's no money obligation whatsoever, but uh, because we checked with everybody just to do due diligence, we need to bring it to you all to make sure you guys agree with the contract. But there's no money on our behalf. We just do the repairs. They make sure we get the parts. They don't send somebody out, and they're done quickly. No money contract? I think that could go on consent. Yeah, we like those. All right, drug, excuse me, bus driver shortage discussion. You guys saw an email from Mr. Moore last week regarding bus 114. Um, we, we had a bad situation. I think this was last Thursday morning where we had a driver who was sick, um, wasn't able to call in, uh, slept through the morning. At about 7 o'clock, they realized bus 114 had not left the lot. Uh, lucky me, I got the call. Uh, within about 10 minutes, I was headed north. But we were at that point running over an hour behind. Uh, the middle school run, I ran the middle school and the elementary at the same time. Picked up more elementary kids than middle school kids. Uh, and we had a little bit of a buzz about not notifying. So, so two things in Mr. Moore's email that we wanted to discuss with you guys was We've rectified notifications. I'm, I hate to say, but bus 114 was late this afternoon, and, and everyone at Battle Creek Elementary got a remind app uh, notice from the school that the bus was running behind and how long it was running behind. That's not a perfect world, but we did at least let folks know where the bus was and how far behind it was. So we've rectified the first part of that. What we did to make sure that there's always someone that can notify that, the five folks in the office at the bus garage, uh, actually the six folks in the office at the bus garage, uh, Jonathan Berry, our safety coordinator, Misty Gaines, my uh, assistant, and myself, we were all given access to every school so that if something happens, whether it be a wreck, whether it be a delay anywhere, uh, we can get a notice out. There was a really bad wreck on Hampshire Pike, Pike today uh, and Mr. Berry was able to send a notice out to the folks at school letting them know that buses might have to be rerouted. So we've taken care of the first part of that, and we're going to be very diligent in doing that. The only thing I've got to fight is now my staff is getting notices from 23 schools every time somebody sends a notice, and they may, they may have mutiny on me before this is over with. So, but we've taken care of that. The second part of that is just the driver shortage uh, itself. And Mr. Moore and I had a conversation we are right now combining daily about nine routes and then the other day we were we were right at eight or nine drivers short last thursday on top of that um, you guys know um, that we have an aging population the average age of a driver is somewhere around 66 to 67. the average starting age of a new driver is in the low 60s uh, i have a driver that's that's i have a couple drivers that are in their 80s um, they do have to maintain a health card. They do have to maintain a CDL and are state approved every year. These are folks that go through random drug tests. They are the only drug tested folks in our school system uh, and it is at a random pace. And the, the National Safety Board, National Highway Safety just up that to 50% randoms every year. So half your staff has to be random at least once every year. Um, problem that we see, and I, and I didn't bring anything to ask for you tonight since this was discussion, but we want to do this moving forward, is talk about the pay. And, and I know, and I'm not going to get on the, the, the soapbox, we've already kind of gone through that. I will say I have 405 employees on my side of the, of the house, and if you include me, two of my people are certified. Uh, everyone else is classified. Uh, a bus driver, a regular ed bus driver makes $67.48 a day. Special needs driver makes $71.48 a day. A substitute with a high school, grad, uh, high school degree or a GED makes $86 a day. And they are not subject to drug tests, they do not maintain a health card, and they do not have to carry a CDL. 
Um, this is just one example. Miss, Miss Gerard and I have had this conversation twice in the last couple of days. It goes back to the conversation y'all have had. As much as I say we need to do something with bus drivers specifically because this is a big hole right now, I'm leery of, of doing a whole lot for one group ahead of a, uh, a um, salary um, study. But we have four. We have one leaving at the end of the month. He's moving to Florida because they pay $25 an hour. We have four leaving at Christmas. And Mr. Pinkston told me today he has somewhere between 9 to 15 that have told him they're contemplating leaving at the end of the year. So we have a, a, an issue that, that is arising, that is getting more every day. Um, Marshall County starts drivers at, at $82 a day, and they are looking to up that. And the way that we've looked at other districts, Marshall County had the most sensible way. They pay drivers with starting pay what you pay a substitute. Uh, now, they do have a graduated from there up, but if you paid $86 a day, that's $21.50 an hour compared to $16.87 or $17.87. So the discussion is that, that maybe not right now, but as we move forward, and, 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 I, and look, across my, my departments, I have needs. Um, we, have, we have building operators that make less than $11 an hour, and we can't get them. Uh, we, we have lots of low-paying jobs that, that are very painful. I've said this to you before, and I say this as a certified employee, and I hope that all the certified people understand what I'm saying. Um, you make a livable wage as a certified employee. We have a lot of classified folks that don't make a livable wage. Uh, and we have a lot of folks that work for benefits and a lot of folks that work for goodness. And I will tell you, a lot of folks at the bus garage work because they want something to do. Um, they start gathering at the garage in the morning about 4.15, um, because it's, it, it, it is their community, and they're there for the kids, they're there for each other. That group of folks is passing, and I don't mean that, it, I don't mean that in, a, in a disrespectful way. They're leaving. They're leaving our workforce. Um, in, in the seven years that I've been associated with transportation, it is the only department that I know of that has lost at least one employee every year. We've, we've lost a transportation employee this year. Uh, it is an aging staff. It is one that is struggling, and it is struggling for us to maintain. So as I told Mr. Moore the other day, the only way that I see this and the only way other districts are, are solving this transportation issue is they're upping the hours that they pay and they're upping the pay. Um, in Williamson County, you can make up to $28,000, $30,000 a year driving a school bus. Um, you know, they pay $3 an hour, or they did. I don't want to quote that, but they used to pay $3 an hour if you came from out of county to drive a bus in their county. Some drivers work four hours, some drivers work six hours. All bus drivers in the metro are paid for eight hours. They don't work eight hours. Um, I have issues with paying someone for hours that they don't work, but I also understand why those counties have done what they've done. So the issue that, that, that may be the spark for discussion tonight is we, we are in a, a hard place for these folks. Um, and, and I will tell you this, I drove a bus for, for almost 13 years as a coach and as a, a teacher and an administrator. And it's one thing to drive a bunch of kids to, to uh, a, a field trip with two or three teachers on the bus and you're not really worried about what's going on behind you because teachers have it. Um, you put anywhere from 40 to, to 75 kids of, of age from five to 18 behind you with, with what goes on in, in our, our schools and it's happening behind you. Uh, and then drivers and roads and things like that. These, these folks are, are performing a duty that is a, it's a skilled classified position. And, and right now it, it's not paid as a skilled position is out in other parts of the world. So I, I, I say all that, I was just asked to bring this to you guys to start the discussion. Um, I am, Leary of picking one group above another, but, but I do see this as a group that, that sooner rather than later we're going to have a, a gaping hole that we're going to really have to step up to fill, um, maybe more so than other of, of the positions across my, my department. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Have, I, I know, well, just Hampshire for, is really the only one that I know of a teacher driving a bus also. Have we you, whoever thought about incentivizing 
and made it making it available to more teachers yeah. the, the, and i will tell you mr hickman and i talked about this and i actually i actually was a hamster during the summer and we were a driver short and and just in the office i told miss kathy um, john paul jones is, is the teacher that drives a bus he was in the office and i told miss kathy i said if you'll let him drive a bus i've got the hamster problem fixed and she said i can do that uh, and he's driving a bus every morning. He's teaching all day, and he's driving a bus at night. He's coaching on top of that once he gets back. But what we look at for a for a teacher for a non salary or for a salary exempt is is he's picking up around sixteen thousand dollars a year on his CCRS with no cost to us on benefits. So because his benefits are already paid, so we're actually saving money in the transportation world by paying him to do that that task. The problem comes into will other teachers have schedules that will allow them to do that? His bus arrives before 7.30, and he doesn't start his day until 7.30. She made an allowance instead of his stop time being 3 o'clock. She made him be able to leave school at 2.40 so that you know he can go and take a bus. In some schools, that may not be possible. Uh, but it is something that we've looked at. Actually, his sub driver, our sub driver in Hampshire is, is a teacher as well, and that has worked out very well for us this year. But that was because that administrator uh, structured the day and was willing to allow us to do that. Mm, Mr. Lindsey. I did, uh, that was going to be one of my points. Um, I didn't realize that we allowed that. Uh, there was a time where we didn't. <laughs> this was the first year we've had. So and I, I think it might be good to make sure that that's known um, and we could even get creative with that if I might drive in the morning if Chad will drive in the evening. Yes. Uh, yes. No, not me. <laughs> 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 not me, and here comes my next point. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm going to be, um, Mr. Perriman knows this, but just to be totally up front, I have a brother that drives a bus. I have... Uh, my mother retired as a bus driver. Uh, I have an uncle who drives a bus, but um, I, I, I've had bus drivers tell me, here's why we have a shortage of bus drivers, because kids don't act right on the bus, and when they don't act right, they can't do anything about it because administrators won't, ta won't help them take care of their problem. Now, nobody wants to hear that, but, th but that's just the honest truth, that uh, we got a kid that uh, won't act right on the bus and, and this bus driver uh, is having to put up with it and then he puts the kid off the bus or lets an administrator know and the kid's back on the next day. Um, I had a bus driver say one time uh, and he said this more than once. He said it, a, a, an instructor in the classroom, if they have a kid acting up, the worst thing that happens is it, it uh, affects the other kids in the classroom. He said, as a bus driver, I got a kid that don't act right. His attention, my attention has to go to him. He said, the worst thing that's happened is I kill everybody on the bus. And <clears throat> so that's, um, there's a lot of issues that go around there. But I think we could help our bus drivers out by, first off, um, you know, and we talked about this in our retreat from a discipline standpoint. Uh, as you said, and as Mr. Morda said, you know, and as I said, don't, don't ask me. I'm not driving one. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to put up with what they put up with every day. And then I think it's frustrating from their part that uh, when they do have those issues, they, they just don't feel like they have any support. So I will say to that that um, I felt that one of my greatest strengths when I went to transportation was that I had been an administrator and that I understood what administrators were looking for. I was probably, I was very hard on bus riders because it was a, um, it's a privilege more than anything else. Nothing says we have to provide it outside of the world of special populations. Uh, we work real hard, Mr. Pinkston does as well. We work real hard to hold schools accountable. One thing that we have done is, is not through discipline, but through what we call a revocation of services. If we deem that you are a safety issue, we revoke your right to wear a to, to ride a bus and we do it up for a year, that is not a, a discipline that goes in their discipline. It's just that you get a letter from, from the school on our behalf that says that 
um, you can't ride a bus anymore. And we have an appeal process that goes through there. They appeal to me. And, and I will tell you that came about from we had students throwing cans. Uh, we had a, a person buy a brand new Dodge truck and was headed home to Dixon and got out on Industrial Park and a student stood up and threw a full Pepsi can and busted his windshield and he hadn't put seven miles on his truck yet. That, that student's a danger. That student is a danger not only to the kids on the road because the drivers, look, I mean the kids on the bus, the drivers looking up in the mirror rather than at the road, but that's a danger to other people on the road. We reserve that to children and to instances that we have deemed are truly a safety issue. But that is a place that we stepped in because I will tell you the administrator at that time just said, well, it's the first time they've ever done anything on the bus, it's a warning. Um, and they wanted to hold to that and we just had to say, no, that's not right. This person put, you know, 50 or 60 kids in a bad place uh, a driver in a bad place. So we, we, we try to address that, but that is a, a very valid point that we do fight from school to school. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hale. I mean, you know, another, I mean, you open to teachers, but, you know, we also have EAs that are making $14,000 a year. They may want to jump on that or not. But another option, we could probably put bus assistance or something on the buses to assist. I mean, if you've got 75 kids on a bus, that's hard for a teacher to hold 75 students in a classroom. So why are we expecting this bus driver to multitask and drive on a road that, I mean, if you're in Spring Hill, I mean, traffic's not great there. Some of our other county roads are, you know, this wide. And now they're looking at 60 kids while they're doing all that. I mean, I know other districts do have um, something like that where they have an assist, somebody on the bus to help with the kids. Ro Robertson County has a, a rider on every bus. We have riders on our special needs buses. We do that by law. And then we have about seven riders that, that are paid for out of 141, and we rotate those around to, to one buses that have an issue um, that, that it, we've seen a high discipline rate. But the other thing is, Right now, we have so many people driving routes that are not their routes, uh, and we're so unstable on a consistent driver sometimes that uh, bus 114, the one that we're talking about in Spring Hill, it's had a rider on there so that if someone like me shows up to drive, that person knows where we're going. Uh, and I'm not trying to read a route sheet while I'm driving a bus. So we, we try to make those allowances. We can get riders all day. The problem is, is getting drivers right now. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Lindsay. Just one more question. Mr. Gerard, you, you cringed a little bit when he, I I just, is there some? Oh, with the class, there is a difference. It would, it would greatly impact far as budgetary-wise when we open it up to EAs because they're non-exempt status. So then you'd be, anything they would be making over 40 hours a week, then that would be time and a half. So we can offer that but from a budgetary standpoint and like make sure we're good on our legal um laws la labor laws we'd have to make sure we're tracking what they're doing we're paying them accurately um so it would it would be more than just paying what a normal bus driver would make that that was my cringe to make sure we're following our labor laws gotcha and and I, correct me if i'm wrong we could get creative with that like i was saying Chad and I are both EAs, but we split that up to where um, maybe we're not paying as much overtime. That, that right, way. and if that's that's just a discussion that we'd have to have if that's something we want to do. Is we would have to factor in overtime into our budgets. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there's no action we need to take on this tonight. Let's move on to the superintendent evaluation. Yes, yeah, what I've uh, presented to you guys is just um, talking with Mr. Moore, listening to some of your feedback. It was a shorter, more condensed version for a superintendent valuation. Um, it has eight areas. I would prefer to have 10. I left two open, talking about the vision, mission, and some possibly input from the board members to add two more areas to this. Kind of at your will, what you would like to see as part of the evaluation. And I will take any questions you may have on this. Well, I guess my first question kind of stems from our conversation last week. Um, 
kind of revisiting and looking at the goals that you've set based off of what we've talked about, I think that would be a key thing to include in the evaluation process. Um, where do we stand on that? Do we need to do a retreat, or is that something that could be in the November work session, or what I, What do you see? You know your goals better yeah. than I do. I think what we can do is one of two things. I can, uh, the problem with coming to a work session, we can do that, or we can do it with a retreat. Um, either or, if we did a retreat, maybe um, during the week, I don't think it would take too long to come up with those, but I would prefer for the last two goals kind of come from both of us working together and deciding what those two goals are. And I, I don't want to lead you in a direction right yet. Th I hope that makes sense. Ms. Kinzer. I'm just a little confused because it seems to me if we're evaluating, it would be you, you've never really articulated as a group what your goals are for the year, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, we all maybe have different goals, but we've never, and maybe, and we've talked about mm -hmm. talking about that in a retreat or anything, but we're gonna evaluate th you on that. It can't be our goals, it has to be yours. Correct, like my e yearly goals, I do have those set, and those are uh, passed down to the principals, and I have that as in numbers and success rate, I don't think you shared that with us. So and it's the same ones I had last year. Okay. And I, I shared those last year with you guys, and they will stay the same throughout because they are in percentages. And I feel percentages are better than giving whole numbers because uh, if you have, for example, a school that is 60% proficient versus a school that's 10% proficient, it's hard. If I put a hard number, it might be easier for one and harder for the other to achieve that. Two, uh, like, and I had the principals have input last year and help develop these together as a group. Uh, for example, I came out and I said 5% increase on ACT. The principals real quickly came back and said, well, if we go 2.5%, we can achieve that 21 in five years where we feel that 5% will be really unreachable. So those are some of the things we did. And I'll send those back to you guys, those same goals. Um, it, it's the same ones in the probably springish, winterish okay. I sent to you Thank guys. you. Yeah, we'd appreciate seeing that. Mr. Moore. So, uh, yeah, I had already looked at this and, and had a couple of thoughts on this. I know, for one, I, I do, I, I like that it's uh, a little more brief than we've looked at in the past. I think it encompasses, I mean, I mean we can always – as I go into the questions, some of them I think we could probably pick apart and do something a little different. I, mean, I would love to hear some feedback from other people. I think the biggest thing for me that, um, uh, and one of the requests I had to go with that too, and I think it's been added, I, you did add in there about that, um, that a narrative of some form was required if you gave a, a one or a two on those. And I think that's vitally important, uh, more so for the superintendent to have some, some feedback from where we're, we're at. I mean, I'll be honest, if I just, gave him a bunch of ones going through here. Um, it's, I, I don't know if I'm, he's going to get much information from that. Um, so I think it's important that that's a, a piece that's included. I will say, uh, if you go to the instructions, the items number three and four um, is a pretty stark difference from what we do now. So you may want to look at that and, and make sure that that's something that this board wants to get into. It basically, it, rather than just uh, gathering up 11 different evaluations and just kind of averaging the score, I guess, is how we've done it in the past, and putting that together, this would actually be more of a collaborative score where we would actually grade these. As a board, we would get together and discuss where we're at um, and, and then move ahead with giving uh, kind of a score as a board to the superintendent. Um, I can see pluses and minuses of that. I know there's some, some good things and some bad things there. I think one of the things that I saw as a benefit there is that I think it would have help this board to go along with some of the retreat work we did, which was creating some, some targeted goals for the superintendent so that we all kind of know what they were aiming for the same thing. Along those lines, we could, as a board, uh, reaffirm those and make sure that we're all still heading the same direction. Um, but then, too, uh, having this board sit down and kind of uh, go over our scores and our answers and come to an, uh, a singular voice on that may be difficult in, in – reality to, to get to so I don't know how that would work out but I do see some benefits that I think it would
help this board to create a more unified voice and to make sure that we're keeping certain things in focus of what we want our leader to be able to take this, the direction we want the, him to take the um, district. So just some thoughts I had on that moving ahead. Mr. Lindsey. Um, just looking over the, where a narrative would be required for a, for a one or a two, I, I don't, we, we had a lot of discussion uh, during your first evaluation about how much importance you placed upon those narratives. So I don't, I don't have a problem with that, but but along those same lines, I think if, if we're going to uh, compose some type of narrative for a one, we also need to compose some type of narrative for if we give a uh, score of four, that it, if it's something really outstanding, we, we ought to um, document that as well and be able to back that up. So. Um, I think that the narratives are really important, so and I think we need to give them on, on both ends of the spectrum. Okay, thank you. If, if I could jump in there, Wayne, that's actually was my original thing. I preferred to see a narrative required on every single question if it were up to me. Um, I, I dialed it back just because I figured nobody else would want to do that, but I find that to be very important as well. Okay, thank you very much. I guess my next question then would be, we've kicked around the idea and said we've got a lot of things that need to be talked about at a retreat. So let's figure out what kind of uh, format and topics we want to do. I think some things we've talked about could be addressed at work sessions. Some things need to be at a retreat either Saturday or sometime through the week. I've received positive comments about both of those time frames. Uh, how do we want to proceed with this? How would this? Uh, let me ask this question first. How would the staff like to proceed with this? First of all, I know Saturdays right now is going to be tough for everyone because a lot of people are involved in their own kids doing things. I mean, me, myself, I can do any Saturday. Uh, but I know for some of you, it's football. Your kids are in basketball or football or all that. So, Or archery season, hunting season. So, I, I, you know, for me, I think talking to Eric and, and Scott, you know, we would prefer doing it during the week. However, we all are available on the Saturday. So we're flexible staff, and I've talked to them both about it. Okay. Well, that's we, 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 a very you know, agreeable answer. And if you, yeah, if you want us to make the call, we can, but we're agreeable. Well, no, I think it. we're maybe talking about two different sets yeah. of discussions, one facilities and long-range planning in that area, the other, more, correct me if I'm wrong, more goals and a discussion around that. It was kind of my understanding that the goals could be more fit into a work session because it's something we have already kind of formed a little bit around. And we can do that in a work session or we can do a committee. Okay. Go ahead. So what I envisioned, I'll, I'll just tell you where I'm at. It make it, we can start there. Uh, what I envisioned was we take some of the work we did at the retreat where, where you guys had kind of taken the, so to speak, marching orders for what specific goals, and I think we had narrowed that down to a short list. What I I think Mr. Chairman was looking at was if you could bring us essentially that short list and we could carve out a time in a work session, review that, and then basically as a board, we could move that on to the, and just sign off on it either. Maybe maybe we take a formal vote on it just to say that this is what we agree is our fiscal year, you know, 21, 22 goals. Uh, and that would carry us for the next year. That's how I envisioned that part taking place. I don't know if anyone else saw it differently. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I was going for. Okay. So we could do that at the November work session. I will point out, though, that everybody looked at tonight's agenda and commented, oh, there's not much uh, controversial on here. And now we're into two hours and 40 minutes of discussing non-controversial issues. So let's add a whole discussion about long-range goals on there next month. The other discussion then we need to have, and I think this is a very pressing one, is the facilities planning. Uh, if no, for no other reason, we need to decide what kind of colors we're putting in the school at the Battle Creek property. Where is that a Saturday morning discussion? Okay. 
let's go for a Saturday morning discussion. I'd say let's go ahead and start at least discussing what um, what we're looking at with the Saturdays. Do what? November 13th. Saturday, November 13th. Chad can do that, so that's when we're having it. <laughs> well, I get two off a month, so I'm using that one. Does that push us too late, though? No. Okay. Last work session, we, we actually adopted the, the building plan in January last year. So okay. if we meet in November and work through November and then December, if we do that initial meeting, maybe then a work session or a board meeting, we can have it done by January, I think. Now let's see if that comes before. That would actually be after the work session. I don't know if it matters or not. I think if we have that Saturday discussion, then we can we can bring that in December. So the voting I think meeting. if we're good in January as we go into budgeting is when we really need to do it. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Yeah, so just so I understand how we're going to go into that, I, w I would think you're going to bring us kind of your ideas for a five-year plan um, as well as any facilities related hot button topics you feel like you need some clarification on to move through this next year yes and 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 just so you know i have asked all of my departments um, we do this with buses anyway we give you a five-year rotation that we send to the commission so that they're aware of what's coming capital wise i've asked tommy to do the same thing for devices that we see need to be replaced whether it's funded through 141 or through capital operationally we're going to bring you five-year plans that you may just take it as an FYI but we're, we're trying to look more holistically at everything that we're going to need from money to buy land to buildings to uh, grounds to to those types of things so that we're giving you a realistic uh, Chris is going to bring numbers for a, a realistic 189 ask and then what could go in 141 so we're trying to do a more overarching look whether you need that time the, the big discussion will come back to the buildings um, but we're trying to at least provide information so that you see more than these okay. things shouldn't come up month to month and surprise everybody right. thank you okay mr Lindsay. nobody wants to say it so i'll just say it but we got to decide what we're going to name the school at battle creek so do we need to wait till December to do that I mean in the planning process we don't such a and, I, and I'm going to call it trivial and it may not be there anybody else but I just I don't want to put you behind the eight ball over a name no we're, we're I know I said that that Saturday morning I just sooner rather than later I think that if we discuss it that may be something that you discuss in November uh, take action in December we're good I mean we're, we're early enough in this planning phase right now that we haven't gotten to those types of things but but that will come up rather quickly okay thank you all right so we will meet November 13th in the morning for our Saturday retreat we will tackle the goals portion at our next work session in November we will have our next voting meeting on the 2nd of November regularly scheduled um anything else i'm forgetting folks i wrote down 8 30. uh that would be 8 30 a.m thank you mr lacona yes there is a education event coming up the chamber's hosting. I've already made my reservations through some other entity, but I'll be there. The county commission has invited us to a Christmas party in December. Um, as it stands now, Commissioner, or Chairman Morrow and myself will be providing musical entertainment. How's that for you? Um, and there was one other thing I was supposed to add and announce. Oh, there is a uh, a uh, Veterans Day event honoring uh, Mr. Uh, Patterson from the uh, who passed away from the uh, Veterans Administration, and I'll email forward that email to everybody as well.
Mr. Lacone. I have an announcement uh, from finance. Uh, Ready Sub is coming. Kronos is coming. It's actually already being used in food service at this time. Um, so you'll see some emails come through about that and some trainings, um, some videos, things like that. So if you hear from any employees, that's coming. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, well, hey. Okay, that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Don't don't forget about the elected officials picnic. Elected officials picnic next Tuesday evening. And then just an update, we're expecting our first installment of the BEP any day now, right, Doug? Glad that, glad that that's coming in on its way. Thank you very much. All right, y'all have a good night. I'll see you again uh, November. Unless you come next Tuesday to the elected officials thing.